Hello, we are continuing this seven ongoing part, I don't know how many parts we're going to have of this, of why Furiosa, a Mad Max Cyber, is receiving so much hate. Um, it's receiving a lot of bloody hate. I'm going to try to work on my Australian accent. I don't understand why it's, understand why it's receiving so much hate. I mean, it's like, um, where were they going? So full of hope. There is no hope. That's a quote from the character in Dementis, played by Chris Hemsworth. Um, I'm not going to say there's not hope for the franchise or for the for the uh, uh, movie. I don't really want to talk about the Mad Max franchise because I just want to talk about the movie. But from the movie perspective, it's fine. I've seen it uh, again today. That makes it the fourth time I've seen it in IMAX alone. I don't even want to see it in Dolby uh, Cinema. I just want to see it in IMAX. Um, I'm probably not going to go see it again because uh, at this point it would be like obsession and... I don't like to be obsessed with movies unless I have an exquisite reason. Uh, and part of my moving around, I'm just moving around because I'm trying to get my eye patch ready. If you notice, I'm closing my white eye because I had eye surgery and it's making my eye look rather wet, as you see. Uh, there's like stitches and stuff and I can't really see out of it. It's like nothing but light. You know, it was like more darkness before the surgery, but after the after the surgery, there's like less darkness and more light. And uh, I can't really make out anything with my white eye, so... Anyway, excuse me as I babble on, I'm just trying to, you know, uh, get this eye patch going. You gotta tape the, you gotta put the little gauze inside the, the eye pad, or the, eye, the eye thing, the eye guard, and then tape the whole thing to the eye. And Well, there you have it. Uh, I want this to hold overnight as I sleep. I'm supposed to sleep with my head down so that the pressure of my head being faced down the pillow will will hold the uh the gas bubble insecure and that's what's securing the the back of my wet the eye wall in order for it for the for the for the tail to heal heal up so that uh within six months from now the same doctor or another doctor can put the um artificial lens in place so basically i'm not going to be able to see for like six maybe seven months hopefully be six only and uh yeah so I'm not sure how they do this. I guess they have better aim because I'm still, and they can do it while, I, while I'm asleep. But doing this as awake without a meal is like, well, I might as well just go blind anyway. Anyway, um, so Furiosa, I've saw it for the fourth time, and I'm going to say it again. I'm defending this movie. It is absolutely not woke. It is not feminist at all. I, I can see how it can be viewed as feminist. I, 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 I'll take it as this. Having watched it a fourth time, I paid attention particularly to the ending scene when um, I mean, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy's character, Furiosa, is, got, is basically holding uh, Chris Hemsworth's character of Dementus at, not hostage, but uh, he's, he's, he's holding, she's holding him at her mercy. And I've, I know there's plenty of movies that, are, that the woman has done that to the man and has instantly been viewed as feminist and even woke in this generation, but it, it's not woke. I can see how it, it's almost feminist. It's almost feminism. It's almost feminism. But it's not. Because if you look at Furiosa's background, that is everything that started from the moment the movie opened up with Furiosa picking the peach from the peach tree with a friend and then getting caught and then getting taken to the mentis. Within the first 30 minutes, if you remember that first 30 minutes of the movie as it opened up, the first 30 minute opening, you'll realize why Furiosa is so determined to catch Dementis. And it's funny because Dementis didn't even really kill her mother. It was actually the octopus that killed her mother because he's the one that's questioning her and torturing her. So in order to deliver the fatal blow, it had to be the octopus, which she already killed using the bobby knocker, um, which is that uh, famous spinning spiky device at the end of the uh, war wig. It's in, it's, in, it's in Fury Road, but of course, Furiosa being the origin story, they show how they build it, particularly for the purpose of uh, you know, using the driver Praetorian Jack to, trans to, to uh, transport the food goods, the water, the veggies, the butter's milk, all the way to the gas town and bullet farm to get in exchange for gasoline and bullets, aka ammunition, respectively. So, no, the movie's not really woke. I don't know why people keep saying that. Um, to me, the people that say that it's woke and feminist, 
or basically not really educated on what feminism really is and what true wokeness actually looks like. They're just saying what everybody else is saying. And that's just, it's just not right, man, because this movie, it, it, it has the potential to be a really good movie. Uh, it's been for IMAX, obviously. And movies like this is what are, what we need. And, and, uh, and this is some of my history. This is the... This weekend, we celebrated the release of Fury... Sorry, I, don't have, I do not have my earbuds on, earphones on. And she is dressed up for this character for some odd reason. You know, just, just, just to get views and likes, she's trying to feed off of a franchise that she's not familiar with, and for a franchise that she doesn't, she doesn't really know well, doesn't really like it. Well, I, I don't know if she's, she's probably familiar with it. She, I'm not going to say she doesn't like Mad Max. She just doesn't like this movie. And she's just feeding off of it, just for clicks and likes, just because she's a cosplayer that happens to be able to just as Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. There was merch, but I was really there to ride these babies. After a quick photo op, it was time to mount up. As you can see, I was all geared up for the wasteland. We made sure to add on some real safety gear. From there, we set off, and we took a quick stop in this sunflower field. My dad was there with me as my partner in crime. After some photos, I was rearing and ready to go, and we hauled ass through dusty trails all the way back. By the time we got back, I was absolutely covered in dust, but I had a furiously good time, and I can't wait to see Furiosa in theaters on May 24th. This week, you really don't even want to see. You never wanted to see it. You lied. You didn't want to see it after this. So why are you still posting it? She's clearly trying to get likes and views. Uh, I, I hate tomboys like that. That 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 you know they they all, only only want to be for the camera. <laughs> this week, I, I know I'm not supposed to hate from a Christian perspective, but I cannot stand tomboys like that. You know, and and, and inside they're always goalie goalie. They're always goalie goalie. It's just. She, she can't talk about a franchise that she doesn't understand. Uh, so I want to see what other people are saying about it, obviously. Like, there's this individual I just found, Midnight's Edge. Reviews. Now, since they don't want you to fix your car. I've been I've been I've been watching reviews like crazy. Other people's take on movies that I've seen. Movies, it's a stunning movies that I happen to like, actually. In uh, Civil War, I pretty much just I really really wouldn't I really really watched a bunch of videos by other people talking about the movie, how they liked it, they didn't like it, they didn't understand it, they couldn't stand how Alice Garland was so vague about everything, didn't have a clear reason as to why the character the characters were doing what they're doing what caused the civil war blah 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 and now i'm just fascinated with why everybody literally every single almost every single movie review of this film for yosa uses the term flopping i have never seen the word flopping or flop used any more than i've seen it now with Furiosa. it's because of the two f's so you got words like flop flopped the past tense and flopping, which is the present participle, that people keep using them. A I, 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 I Mad Max saga postmodium. Furiosa, a Mad Max tale, is a stunning flop worldwide, a fact which has made some very salty. But it should have come as no surprise, as its failure was entirely predictable to all but those who greenlit it. How can that be, you wonder? Let's find out. This video is sponsored by Galaxy Lamps. Domestically, Furiosa opened opposite Garfield, and their respective box office takes were within striking distance of each other. But since Garfield only came in at a fraction of the cost of making Furiosa, Furiosa is the undisputed loser in that matchup, as the Mad Max spin-off needed to open to twice of what it did in order to have a chance of breaking even. The numbers are as bad or worse internationally, so Warner can start preparing for that write-off on the losses they're gonna incur on this one right away. There is something noteworthy about those numbers though. 
See, this isn't a case of the audience going to see the movie and then deciding that they didn't like what they saw and then opt out of seeing it a second time and tell their friends. See, this isn't a case of the audience going to see the movie and then deciding that they didn't like what they saw and then opt out of seeing it a second time and tell their friends and family to stay out of it too. That would have indicated bad word of mouth. And don't get me wrong, the movie might still get that and fall off a cliff next weekend. But that's not what happened here, or not yet at any rate. No, these kind of numbers... Now hold on a second, his voice sounds very similar to... Uh... Uh, the... Uh, what was it called, the drinking something, he... He, he's another movie reviewer uh, on, he's very known, the, the Critical Drinker. So he has a certain Australian accent voice, which, you know, Australian because well, the film is Australian property, so Australian franchise. But I just can't help but think that the Midnight Edge here is trying to sound like um, a Critical Drinker. That's, that's, that's uh, funny. Where a movie with this kind of budget couldn't even crack 30 million over its regular three-day weekend indicates that the majority of the movie-going audience flat out rejected it unseen. To put it into context, adjusted for price hikes and inflation, half or more of those who saw Mad Max Fury Road nine years ago decided not to bother with Furiosa. That's what happened here and what we need to focus on. The majority of the audience rejected it unseen. Why would they do that? We're about to find out. But first, have you ever wanted a personal night sky in your room? Well, you should, and the Galaxy Projector, the sponsor of this video, can help you out with that. Today, most of the night sky is blotted out by light pollution, especially if you live in or near a city. But this state of affairs represents but the blink of an eye in the breadth of human history. Since the dawn of time, our ancestors were gazing at the stars and the planets, and doing so remains as fascinating and soothing as ever. If you've been thinking of adding a little something special and intrinsically appealing to your space, then the Galaxy Projector will provide exact... Wouldn't put down on the Because there's a shitload of immigrants to fit. There's too many. Exactly the kind of lighting you need. It will bring space and the nighttime sky into any room, giving it a truly unique look and timeless feel. But in being a smart device, it also brings the best of the modern world. First off, its RGB colors, brightness, rotation speed, on and off timers and many more features are all fully customizable. With the app, you can make it truly yours from your mobile. Do you like the simplicity of Amazon's Alexa or the Google Assistant? Well, the Galaxy Projector also offers that hands-free magic, obeying your word to switch on or to change mode and more. It is also energy efficient, so you can enjoy your personal galaxy without your electricity bill skyrocketing. In short, if you appreciate modern tech with a timeless appeal, the Galaxy Projector is for you. And naturally, we have a deal for you. If you head down to the link in the description and type in our code Midnight's Edge when ordering, you get 15% off. So head on over to that link and order yours now. And with that, 
let's get back to the topic at hand and look at the reasons why Furiosa was flat out rejected by the majority of moviegoers who simply didn't bother showing up for it. When you wash your body, do you use a moldy loofah, a dirty washcloth, or you're that guy that just uses their hands while only scrubbing your pits and privates? Mm-hmm. I'm talking to you. Get the Body Buffer by Manscaped. A body scrubber designed with 100% antibacterial... Let's begin with the least controversial explanation, namely that they simply waited too long. Furiosa was introduced in Mad Max Fury Road, which came out a whopping nine years ago. That's longer than the time gap between Terminator 1 and Terminator 2, and for comparison, the entire original Mad Max trilogy was made inside of just six years. Unlike the original Mad Max trilogy though, Fury Road hasn't accrued a fanbase of its own. Case in point, today there is arguably more demand to see Mel Gibson return as Old Man Mad Max than there is for Tom Hardy to return for a Fury Road sequel. Why? The dude is old, and, and plus if you did that, that would be like a legacy thing. There's no need to bring Mel Gibson back. Really, there's no fucking need. Still, there was a brief moment there, when there possibly was momentum for another movie in the Fury Road universe, when the movie still had a presence in the zeitgeist, and director George Miller did indeed want to do a spin-off movie since day one, and Warner were open to the idea as well. What held it up for years, though, was George Miller suing Warner because he felt it unjust that they withheld a bonus from him since Fury Road went over budget. And on top of that, it underperformed. That legal squirmish held up development of any more Mad Max movies for years. And by the time the dust had settled and bruised egos had mended, the moment had simply vanished. The public zeitgeist had long since moved on. Yet that's when Warner, in their wisdom, decided to go ahead and greenlight Furiosa. Who did that and what may have motivated it, we'll get back to. But even if there had been no legal squirmish, even if Warner had greenlit Furiosa right away, and George Miller had made it within three years of Fury Road, it still might not have performed all, all that well. Sometimes Hollywood gets this idea of that they can do a spin-off movie or even series based on a side character in a franchise where the main character is the main draw holding everything else together. For instance, how many Batman spin-off series have there been over the years that didn't feature Batman? And what kind of mark did any of them leave on culture? Because neither Gotham, Batwoman, nor Pennyworth, the origin of Batman's butler, set the world on fire, let's say. And yes, that last one actually is a real thing. Joker did great, of course, but that is a slightly different story. In the case of Mad Max, though, Mad Max himself is the brand. There is nothing else to latch onto, and timing aside, it could very well be that making a Mad Max movie without Mad Max would never have worked. Case in point, way back in 1984, they tried making a Superman movie without Superman in the guise of Supergirl, which didn't work out too well. Um, what about the show? The show had like, what, two or three seasons? It was fine. A more apropos example as pertains to Mad Max may be Ben Affleck's Daredevil. While it never got the sequel, it did get a spin-off in the guise of Elektra, which was a monumental flop. Even if we flip genders, the precedent for... Okay, so it's okay to have a character that's in a, a movie as a supporting role to have their the own, his or, her, his or her own movie. Because you have, they, his, they, they, look, Elektra has her own comic book series. She practically has her own damn comic book series. Of course she was going to get a fucking movie. And, and look, Han Zolo should get his own film. Because he's a famous character. The same thing with the Hobbs and Shaw. It's okay to have these side movies. I won't even say Furiosa is a side movie. She's, she's a part of the canon. Like, this movie is simply an origin story. It's a prequel. It's not a side project. A side project would be... 
it would be like um, if you made a movie about the the guy that. Hold on, let me open my. Uh, so if I look at, I'm gonna look at Fury Road. It's the character Hux. Hux. Hux played by. He's in the X Men movies for a while. The 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 most recent ones. Hux played by no, Nukes. Sorry, Nukes played by Nicholas Hout. And so apparently the next Mad Max film in the works is gonna be. Is gonna feature Nux. Okay, uh, it might be his movie entirely, like a kind of a, uh, a sp that would be a direct spinoff, and it would have to come from the around the same timeline as Fury Road, not go all the way back to Furiosa or anything like that, because Furiosa is obviously older than Nux, and Nux practically a young adult, and yeah, Furiosa in, the, in this movie is like roughly in the 30s. 35, 37, whatever. It's both the same age. Not, not, not even the same age as, as Max with Rocket Stancy because he has a very, very small wall in Furiosa. He's actually sitting on, leaning on the side of his uh, V8 vehicle of the, the, the Imperator. Not the Imperator, I'm sorry. The, I, I forget what his name, what the, car, what the vehicle's called, but he's leaning against it. But it's not played by, he's not played by Tom Hawley. He's played by his stunt double who is, uh, He's noted in the film. Sorry, I forgot his name as well. But, um, yeah, he's even... So, so besides all that, though... Uh, damn, I lost my train of thought. Uh, this... For spin-off movie. Right. So, so Nux is supposedly going to get his own spin-off series. And people wouldn't even complain about that. Because that was going to be within the Mad Max franchise. The same universe. It's okay to have a movie about a character from that universe. If they turned around and did an origin story... For, for um, Immortan Joe Hill, and the, he already has his own comic book. Like literally, there's a comic book telling about his origin story, how he started off as a as Colonel Joe and became the uh, the warlord Immortan Joe. How he made himself look like a deity or god, and, and establishing these war boys that worship him and are willing to die at a at his very will simply because he is lied to them and told them that he's going to revive them. And they show why the streets of Valhalla forever. Yeah, if you made a spinoff series about this character in Morton Joe, the fans would, no, nobody would say shit. Nobody would complain. So why is there so much hate just because you have an origin story, not a spinoff, of the main character, Furiosa, who is the main character in, in Fury Road? I mean... Even though she supposedly gets more screen time than Max, uh, uh, than uh, Walker Stancy, he's still, Tom Hunter still paid well. Like, he's still a main character. You know, it's just, it's just asinine. I just, I literally, do, I literally do not understand the hate that this movie's getting. Movies featuring side characters isn't a great one. Case in point, Snow White and the Huntsman did okay upon release in 2012, but the spin-off centered on just the Huntsman, even if it had both Chris Hemsworth and Charlize Theron and no Kristen Stewart, was a major flop. Similarly, it could very well be that Furiosa was never going to work, no matter when it was released, or how much momentum was left over from Fury Road. Take Mad Max out of the equation, and there simply might not be enough interest in the world he inhabits to sustain any standalone features based on anyone or anything else in it. I mean, his world is hardly the Marvel Universe, is it? And it isn't Gotham either. But there is another possible reason why this movie flopped, which the Hollywood traits are tiptoeing around, doing their best not to mention, and which has the online punditry seething with rage at moviegoers everywhere for failing to support Furiosa, which they were expected to do for, you know, the cause. If there is one thing the movie-going audience seemingly has had... People literally actually do not do that. They don't lean forward. That might happen. That actually might happen. 
I may have that too. Hardly ever see these, but I really don't see anybody leaving for them that usually. Enough of the past few years, it is girl bosses being shoved down their throats, and based on the poster and trailer alone. Furiosa on the surface looks like more of that. And so first of all, yeah, the way they kind of tie all these characters together, basically they just take different scenes and smash them together. They did the same thing with a few other posters, um, including um, the poster for Boy Kills World, the poster for Bullet Train, which came out like a year ago, uh, two years ago, and the poster for something else. Um, they, they have a habit of like getting the main character and put them at the top, and they have all these mastered characters. But if you look closely, these are literally scenes from the movie. This right here is Chris Himes' character. That's basically this guy, too. Uh, let's see what else. Only one of Morton Joe, obviously two Furiosas. This is obviously her uh, uh, before she lost her arm. Actually, when she's teamed up with uh, Jack, uh, Praetorian Jack, and this is her, obviously. And this is the most recent one. This is, like, within the first th last 30 minutes of the movie. She's lost her, you know, she's obviously lost her arm. She cuts her hair. She has a hood. I can't believe we're doing Assassin's Creed here. Um, and, honestly, I like how... Furiosa's hair was long throughout most of the film. Of course, she goes to different hair changes. She first cuts her hair to do a, to do a trick on uh, this guy, um, Rectus, but then she lets her hair go back out because it just shows that that, that that makes you more feminine. If she had been short hair through the whole movie as an origin story, I would have been upset. I understand it in, in Fury World because she wants to keep her hair short, I guess, because... Actually, I quite don't understand it. I really don't understand it. But the long hair is actually good a good addition. Look, because you're just making sure nobody's sneaking in my room. Okay, I got my door lock. You know, it's showing that she's a woman. Uh, it's showing that, you know, they value the femininity in the green place. They weren't trying to be tomboys. Uh, I know in the movie uh, Fury World, the, 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 the green place, the place of abundance, as they call it, in Furiosa, is known to be kind of feministic because they supposedly only use men for sex and procreation and then once they and then they kick the boys out I mean, the men out and they go off do hunting or whatever if if the woman gives birth to a boy they send the boys out to, to be like slaves or, or sort of somewhat walkers or somewhat, somewhat and they keep the girls so it's kind of like this Amazon feel, Wonder Woman feel to it. And it even and it, it even had that at the first uh ten minutes, like really first five to seven minutes of the film, it had that kind of vibe, that Amazon like vibe, but as I watched the movie it the story unfolds and like, oh okay, first of all there's men in Bell in, in within the Green Place. We see the man, there's a man peddling and as he's peddling it's 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 moving this this stone as uh Furiosa's mother, Mary, um, played by the actress, uh -oh. yeah, I forgot her name, she, she was in that, she was in that other movie, um, with, uh, God, I just, I just cannot help but forget my actors, let's see, let's see, let's see. Control of this. So here we go. Really? Oh, I'm in Philly Road. No wonder. My apologies. No wonder I was in Philly Road. The same similar cast. Oh, so Mary Jabessa, played by Charlie Faisal. Fraser, Fraser. I wonder if she's one of really the Brenda Fraser. Um, so this 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 actress had played in, it was in the movie Anyone But You. Alongside I'm coming his name to memory now. Because he's becoming a well known actor. Glenn Powell. Yeah. So she's in Anyone But You and she she plays a known uh, I'm sorry, she plays an Australian that's basically the, the, the old love interest of Powell's character. She plays Margaret. 
make that of what you will and watch that movie. But anyway, um, the mother, yeah, you know, saving your child, you can understand that. I don't, I don't, I don't think how that's feminist or Amazon at all because you're essentially saving your kid, and that that's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And more often than not, whether or not any individual moviegoer decides to go see any individual movie is based on that surface appearance. Marketing, after all, means more often than not, whether or not the surface looks like more of that. And more often than not, whether or not any individual moviegoer decides to go see any individual movie is based on that surface appearance. Marketing, after all, in a sense, is all about making that surface as shiny as possible. For the better part of a decade now, certainly from Paul Feig's 2016 Ghostbusters remake onwards. Now that right there is woke, darling. Having the all women cast. Moviegoers have been force fed the message that men are useless dolts and women will outman any man in masculine badassery. So basically, Furiosa does not do that. She's not delivering that message. She's simply just trying to get revenge on the guy who killed her mom, which is kind of funny to me because Dementus doesn't really kill her mother. It's actually Octobus, the Octobus that does that. Of course, 2016 is only when it became overt. As my colleague Tom Connors frequently has pointed out, the male lead was sidelined by a proto-girl boss even in 2015's Mad Max Fury Road. Audiences just weren't so sensitive to it back then, but that may be part of the reason why that movie has left no bigger footprint in pop culture than it has. Yeah, because it was kind of the beginning of this gold boss period, which makes sense because Resident Evil, we have a character named Alice, and I mentioned this before. Alice played by Milia Jovovich. She's, she's technically a gold boss, but we don't really see that take on the minds of people that are anti-woke because this is before we really had modern wokeism and the whole aspect of, of feminism, you know. This whole wokeism didn't start really taking hold until after COVID, roughly around the year 2021, if not 2020. So anything that came out before 2020 didn't have any type of wokeism or feminism about it. Um, and Wizard of Evil, the final chapter, came out in 2016. In two more years, it'll be an entire decade since this movie came out. This movie was released, according to Wikipedia, oh, released December 23rd, Christmas Eve Eve, in Japan. Oh, in January 2017 in the United States. So never mind. Come in January 2000... Come in January 27th, 2027, the next two and a half years. This movie would be a decade years old. And it's hard to believe because this was the very last Resident Evil directed by Paul W.S. Anderson. I'm not even going to mention the, the work of the Rackham City because that was an absolute atrocity. But this, this, this one right here with Alice, she's absolutely a boss bait. And even, and even, uh, <sighs> Underworld, Celine is is a boss babe like and that movie is more wet than resident evil because it started off good the very first film was the best one and then the second one was good but by the time the third one came around they got rid of the 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 lead male role of michael Covinas, which was basically what the first movie was all about this guy who's half lichen, half vampire, happen to be a high, half, happens to have the, the strain, the Corvina strain, to the point where if he's bitten by a werewolf, or a.k.a. a lichen, he could become a lichen. But if he's bitten by a vampire, after being bitten by a lichen, he can actually have, he could be a hybrid, which is what this thing is. And because technically, uh, lichen venom is poisonous to a vampire, and also vice versa, so... 
normally a regular person that's turned into a vampire is either going to become a vampire, and if that vampire is bitten by a lichen, then they die. Same thing if you're bitten, if you're turned into a lichen, you're bitten by a vampire, you die. But this guy's DNA, his blood, is allowed, allows him to become a hybrid because he's a direct offspring of the both tribes' ancestor, which is Covino, whatever. I forgot. I forgot the character's name. The point of it is, this guy was the main, was the male lead role. Played by actor Scott Speedman. In after after Underworld Evolution, we we see that Michael um, is not a main character anymore. He's he's just kind of sidelined because it it becomes about Celine at that point. At that point, uh, of course, Celine is at the forefront of the first two movies, Underworld and Underworld Evolution. But right after this movie, in which Michael actually faces off against the mother, the father of our likings, uh, William, um, played by Brian Steele, his twin brother Marcus, played by Tony Coran, happens to be the father of our vampires. So Selena is a vampire that's fighting against the vampire, and while Michael here is fighting against, you know, he's a lichen, he's a lichen vampire hybrid fighting against William. The point I'm the point I'm fucking making is this this is this, this movie. Well, it's the first one. The first two were great, but ever since the after one, the the third one, um, I, I forgot the name of it. I think it's <clears throat> Underworld. Actually, it wasn't the third one because. There was actually a spin-off series, a, a, a prequel, if you will, called Underworld. God, I forget. Oh, my, my memory is so bad. Underworld prequel. The Underworld prequel. Underworld Wise of the Lichens. Now, this is, once again, has another boss babe. This is about the, the character. Um, it's kind of the inspiration for Selene. The character Sonya, who happens to be the daughter of Victor, she's the one that had an actual sexual uh, fail and romantic relationship with the Lucian, the the one that changes the lichen. His lichen DNA is different, so he becomes a different type of lichen to where he's able to change back to his normal form, human form when he calms down or whatever. And he, they can also turn into werewolves at will. The point I'm making in this, in this is that this is basically a boss babe. So all the Underworld movies are a boss babe. With the mainly be, being a female, but uh, really, it's when we started when we got into this underworld awakening is when we started to notice a trend, and this came out in two thousand twelve of of uh, the boss babe as this as this guy. See that movie again today, and the wokeness in it will be much clearer. And I so so it being two thousand twelve was when uh, awakening came out. Okay. It's clearly it would just, it would be it would clearly be seen if this movie came out in today's time it would clearly be seen as feminist and and, and woke and the very last one Blood Wars which is a direct sequel of Awakening came out in two thousand sixteen well for the same year that Resident Evil the final chapter came off came out once again main female the main role is female. Female protagonist. Um, but even this character along with Alice, they they still have their femininity. They're not trying to be all badass. Celine happens to be a mother of a child. Alice happens to be protective of a certain female character that's a child. So, which they got from, you know, Claire Redfield of Resident Evil 2 game. Uh, you know, and... and so it's not entirely woke, but at the same time, th th if these movies were to come out in today's time, they would be seen as woke. They, they just would, I mean. I say that to someone who greatly enjoyed it upon release. Class. See that audiences just weren't so sensitive to it back then. But that may be part of the reason why that movie has left no bigger footprint in pop culture than it has. See that movie again today, and the wokeness in it will be much clearer. And I say that as someone who greatly enjoyed it upon release.
So what he's saying is exactly what I just said about the Resident Evil franchise with Mary Joe Revenge as well as the Underworld franchise. The only reason why audiences enjoyed those movies was this was be this was this was pre woke before the days of woke. This is before the year of two thousand twenty. It's just that the entire world changed after COVID. Uh, people got crazier. People wanted to hurry up and reopen their shops and be able to shop again and go to stores and be able to get out and go to you know, ball games, restaurants, bars, uh, uh, movie theaters, me personally theaters, as well as go back to walk. And we just had all this wokeness kind of ambushes, which is, you know, it, it, that's kind of funny because... Captain Marvel is seen as the most woke character of the MCU, as they call it. Um, and this movie came out 2019, right before COVID, like right on the precipice of COVID, like right when COVID was around the corner, you know. Um, this, this, I, I, the release of it, if I could find it, release dates, yep. February 2009, oh no, March 2019, so roughly an entire year before COVID actually caught. COVID didn't really begin really technically until roughly February going into March of 2020, even though they call it COVID-19. And this movie came out roughly a year before, so never mind what I just said, a year before. So it was right there on the whole time that wokeness began. So that's why this movie is seen as such a, a, a profound example or example, as the Australians and British would say it, of uh, feministic wokeism. The thing is that for years now, nearly every major male-driven franchise that appeals to predominantly male audiences has gotten a female-centric makeover, seemingly in order to bring in more female audiences as well, as the built-in male audience are just assumed to stay put. Kathleen Kennedy herself shared that little tidbit with us. We know that Disney bought Star Wars, and this is true for Marvel as well, because they lacked properties that appealed to male audiences. And that's when Kathleen Kennedy suggested to Bob Iger that all the boys would stay put if they made it female-led, and then the ladies would flock to it as well. Put a kick in it, make her gay! Turns out, she was wrong on both counts. Too bad all of Hollywood followed her lead, including Warner's Unsarnoff. You know, the one who wanted to permanently replace Batman and Superman on film with Supergirl from The Flash and Batgirl from the cancelled Batgirl, before David Saslaw came in and shit-canned her. But so that would be a problem, actually, if you have the female characters completely and permanently replace the male characters. That would be a problem. Um, but Furiosa is actually not to replace Mad Max at all. It's just they jump right into Furiosa from Fury Road instead of going with Mad Max or even Nukes or any other male character and then kind of then going back to Furiosa. You know, the, one could say they, they should have done that, but they didn't. And just because they didn't doesn't mean that this movie is really woke, which is, once again, I don't understand why people think that Furiosa is this feminist woke movie that didn't need to be made. But before that, rather than insisting that George Miller proceed with one of the two other Mad Max movies actually featuring Mad Max that George Miller has been writing for several years now, she was the one who greenlit Furiosa. Despite having data suggesting that doing so might not have been the hottest ideas even at the time. We now have several years worth of data which all tell the same story. From the Charlie's Angels remake, to Star Wars, to the Marvels, to Madam Web. It is always, and without exception, the very female audience that Hollywood is so desperately trying to reach that let these movies down. They Well, I can see Madam Web, but honestly, the, the, the Charlie's Angels is always female-led. They should not have remade it though, honestly. We are the ones staying away in droves. Oh, male audiences are checking out as well, of course, but the bulk of those who actually do show up are still male audiences. 
That is what happens whenever the audience detects a girl boss in a movie, and deservedly or undeservedly, Furiosa looks like one of those. That is not an attack on female-led movies in general, mind you, but rather a commentary on green-lighting executives that are completely out of touch and out of sync with the movie-going audience, male and female. If they were a little bit more attuned, they would have known that female audiences never asked for male-driven franchises to be made female-centric. Case in point, if the dirt, grime, brutality and hopelessness of Mad Max didn't appeal to the majority of the female audience before, then merely swapping him out with a chick that loses her arm no less isn't likely to change that. Then it doesn't help that the reviews are good. It doesn't help that the- I think that this, I th this is what I'm talking about, is a lot of people are misreading the movie. They, they're saying that Furiosa is trying to replace Mad Max. And she's not. It's simply an origin story about the character. Mad Max still exists within the Mad Max franchise. He started it all. You can't replace him. You can't just change the name to a Furiosa saga. Now, if they said Furiosa or Furiosa Saga, that would have been different, because that's establishing a whole new universe. But, it's, they still labeled it a Mad Max Saga. It's, it's clearly a part of the Mad Max universe. I don't know how many times I can stress The movie was expensive to make, or that George Miller has been wanting to make it since before the release of Fury Road. The movie came out too late, after it had lost that Fury Road momentum. And even if it hadn't, it might never have worked anyway, since such spin-off movies hardly ever do. And finally, and perhaps most damningly, it looks like a girl boss movie in an age where the audience have soundly rejected them. Furiosa was as such always doomed to fail. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and remember to look at the stars, and you can get them into your own room with the Galaxy Projector. Get a unique, modern and timeless look for your space, and if you head down to the link in the description and type in our code MIDNIGHT'S EDGE, you'll get 15% off. It isn't woke. It's just nothing woke about it. Film foot. So I want to see film threat because Chris Gord said something. Chris Gord said something. Uh, <laughs> in particular. Anxiety is and design your. I love the family. Look at that fine. Furiosa came out on Thursday, last Thursday, and so far has earned uh, 35 million uh, box uh, domestic, 67 million, 67.8 million worldwide. Um, this is this is uh, more telling than it is interesting uh, because I think for the most a Mad Max story um, mm -hmm. tends to be false advertising because yeah. one. It's a reminder of what the movie's not. <laughs> it, exactly, and the fact and the thing is, is that Mad Max, Mad Max is um, a, a, a legend of sorts. Um, mm -hmm. George, George Miller said uh, certainly after I think Road Warrior leading up to Beyond Thunderdome is that even though Mel Gibson is playing the character in those movies, 
from the perspective of the people telling the stories, because they're all, except for the first one, they're all told in the past. Like the, in, in the road warrior, the kid with the boomerang is actually an old man who's telling the story and we're hearing his voiceover of what's going on with this Max and this adventure that happened. And then beyond Thunderdome is the children in the valley telling, recounting their story of interacting with this guy that's known as Max. The, the concept for, for them is that it may have been a different guy named Max who's helped them, but we as the audience are seeing it as one story because it's, a, it's an amalgamation of all these stories told as once. And that was the fun part because all the worlds are different in every single Mad Max story. There's some similarities, but there's more extremes in regards to the, you know, the, the apocalypse that Mad Max is set. So this was the one I wanted to see. Is the villain in your life's movie? Sometimes it can feel like you're trapped in a maze of fear. At the same time, traditional forms of therapy can have you feeling lost. Dante James from Verbal Riot Show. Dante. Hey, hi. how's it going, boys? I'm good. <laughs> Somehow okay. I made it back sooner than you. So, uh. <laughs> uh, Alan, starting with you, then Dante, and I'll go last. But I thought everyone kind of killed it in this, man. I, I, I thought Chris Helmsworth was a little over the top, but, but in the right way. Mm-hmm. And uh, Anya Taylor Joy, man, she's, she, she did way better than I thought she would do. So. Overall, it was good. I agree. I'm with Dante. I had a really good time with the movie. Um, Anya Taylor Joy is great. Chris Hemsworth chewing the scenery as a villain. I think he really <laughs> after playing Thor, I think he likes being a bad guy. But um, overall, um, uh, really amazing. And George Miller is he would be a great director in the silent era. Much of this film, it whole sequences, no one says a word of dialogue. And the story is told through the action, which I think is so good. Um, there are problems on the front end and the back. Um, uh, mainly the fact that, uh, I mean, obviously it's the story of Furiosa. This felt like, I said this to both of you after the screening, this felt like a four-issue prequel comic that explained the lore of you know gas town and you know um the citadel the citadel and like all these other places how they came to being right what the purpose was all the lore the war boys and the the ravagers out in, out in the uh you know uh you know the wasteland now this was two weeks ago so this is may 19th uh, Chris Gore, he did this, uh, yeah, on a Sunday, two weeks ago, and that's what this movie is, it's an origin story that explains, it's, it explains more of the world from a, an origin story perspective. As a prequel, Furiosa, it, uh, the movie Not the Character, is establishing somewhat of what we already know as Gas Town, for those of you who've seen Free Road, as well as the bullet form, but you know, when I first saw Fury Road the first three times, I did not watch Fury Road. I actually started watching Fury Road. I watched the first roughly 20 minutes just this morning. Still haven't finished Fury Road. I'm going to watch it though because I'm really intrigued about it. And I, I for one, did not ever get into the Mad Max universe. I might have seen some of the movie as a kid, little bits and pieces, but I never watched any of the movies from start to finish. I never even saw Fury Road start to finish, so I'm just actually going back in time and rewatching this movie from 2015. Um, it really. Or well, even the uh, that the Abundance Land. Uh, I forget the name of it, but yeah, you know, the thing I really, I really want to find what what Chris Hill says about using the word woke. He, he said roughly along the lines of the people we we throw that word away way too much, and it is losing. It's becoming cliche. It already is cliche. I used to hate the word woke because I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why people were using it. I just thought it was this fancy new world that the new generation is just throwing around that really doesn't mean anything. Then I learned what it meant, and then I started using it myself, and it became one of my, not my favorite words, but a word I would like to use. And now I'm learning to re-hate it simply because people are misusing the word and the idea of woke. They're misusing it, and they don't understand what it means, or better yet, they know what the definition word is, but they're applying, they are applying it to the raw material. All right. Show that video. So I went to the screening at the AMC Burbank 16. 
and um, you know, uh, saw the film. Was and before sweet. the movie, guess who popped by? And by the way, uh, my opinion opinion. Seen on the big screen, and all of you here and soul into it, and the cinema going. We're so passionate about this film. We put our heart and soul into it, and this. I thought this little part here was like one of the, the chopper bites. Cinema going experience exists because of all of you thank being you. here in the cinema. So thank you very much. Are you guys excited? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, without further ado, please enjoy our movie, Furiosa and Mad Max. Also, me and in San Francisco. She's hot. <laughs> She's hot. So, She's um, but, uh, well, we'll talk about it. I saw it a second time, you know, and well, um, I'll say this, the parts of, the, so you can see our earlier review, the parts of the film I liked, I, I still like the parts of the film that I consider flaws really stood out. That's what is CGI. it? 225. Yeah. It should have been tight two hours tight to it's so e it would be so easy to cut this to two hours. That was too long. The ending is dragged out. The, um, dragged out. The ending is dragged to cut this to two hours. That was too long. The ending is dragged out. The, um, like all the flaws stood out even more. And I don't, I will argue, I don't think this is a girl boss movie. I don't think it's overtly woke, you know? Um, but just because it's not those things doesn't mean it's a good movie. movie i mean i i don't think anyone would debate me if i would say captain marvel is a girl boss mary sue furiosa is not a mary sue she is she gets her ass butt kicked the whole movie the whole movie she's failing 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 she has a few male mentors that help her including a uh, praetorian jack who is a driver that teaches her sort of the the rules of the wasteland but at the end, this movie, I, I finally figured it out. Like, why is this movie not, it's nowhere near as good as Fury Road. It just isn't. It's not. Okay. But I like Anya Taylor-Joy as this younger version of Furiosa. She works. Chris Hemsworth chewing the scenery as uh, Dementis is, uh, is kind of cool. And I like the world building. But you know what this, here's, I figured it out, what it is. This movie is the DLC download if Fury Road was a game. This is like, hey, did you like Fury Road? Well, we've got the new season pass or DLC for that movie. That's what this is. Um, it does, it does more world building, which is kind of cool. But it doesn't, I feel like, and you don't need to see Fury Road to see this, or it's its its own standalone thing, which is fine. I hate, hate that it's called a Mad Max saga. Why? It's its all its all a branding move. Yep. So that really bugged me. But that's sure why George thing, Miller didn't care about that part of it. He doesn't care about the name. That's Warner Brothers. We're going yeah. to give it this name. It's fine. Okay, so let's say if you take off the Mad Max, maybe... George Bill will take off his own. Maybe he'll make a director's cut, and then he'll just take that fucking. Because, because apparently, here's what happened with the, uh, with the uh, a Fury Road. It was made in color first, and M Miller wanted really wanted that movie to come out in theaters in black and white. And and I read this in uh, some of my cinema class, that black and white has a distinct feel apart from color because, like film noir, it establishes the whole. 
cinematography and everything in color, and it, and it has a different feel when it comes to depression and anxiety and just negative feelings and that how that world is seen as apocalyptic and uh, whatever, war, war prone or whatever. If you compare that to color, the only reason why they ever put the movie in color is because the studio wants it in color because most audiences want their films in color. That's why Godzilla Minus One was originally in color and then they went back and did some black and white. They didn't just put it in black and white. They actually rendered it like a black and one, like black and black and white movie, just like the original Godzillas were black and were in black and white, to bring back that old Godzilla nineteen forties and fifties black and white feel. George Miller is going to do this with Furio, so he's going to do it just like he did with Furio. He's going to put it in a black and white feel. He's not just going to paint it black, like you can do with editing by taking out the color and doing the contrast, or whatever. He's actually literally going to make it black and white because. That would have a more film noir perspective, which is, you know, it's not a detective movie like film noir, but still it, it establishes this whole uh, depression and being in a uh, dire situation that I guess you could see is, 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 is the Mad Max franchise. So hopefully when he does that director's cut, black and white edition, he'll take off the Mad Max, a Mad Max saga subtitle, and everybody would be. More prone to see it and less upset about the goddamn subtitle change. It's bugging me that people hate the subtitle because the only reason why you have the goddamn Mad Max Saga subtitle is to establish the simple fact. I would even quit saying guys in the vein. That it's a Mad Max Saga. It's a part of the universe. It's not really a... I mean, yeah, it is a branding thing. But there's a reason why you brand it that way is to let everyone know that it's a part of that universe. It's a Mad Max universe. Mad Max is essentially an Australian franchise, meaning that it was made in Australia. You know? Um, they could have just called it Furiosa, because you do have Superman and Supergirl. You don't have Supergirl or a Superman saga. So yeah, go ahead and just call it Furiosa. But... What about the people who didn't know who Furiosa was or where she was from? Like, I if if I I would have guessed it it was like a Mad Max movie, just by the way it looks. But I wouldn't have known it for sure because I had not seen Fury Road. I still haven't finished it. So if I would have saw the trailer and it's just labeled Furiosa, I would have been like, hmm, I've seen this type of movie somewhere. Wait, this is similar to that Fury Road movie that I never saw because it has the same look and feel. Maybe it's related to that. And sure enough, it is. But at the same time, people would have to do extra research into finding out that Furiosa is a character within that movie, in particular played by Charlize Theron. And maybe that would have actually worked for those who are not fans because if a movie can make you, even a movie trailer can make you do research and want to look into it, maybe you can be like more prone to actually invest some time into reading more about it and therefore maybe buying a ticket, even on Discount Tuesday. So, yeah, maybe that would have been a better marketing tactic to just label it as Furiosa. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say go ahead and do that. Fine, you want to make a Furiosa movie? Fine. So, uh, the parts I liked, and I got to say, the action scenes, amazing. There's a, I think the CG is overly used. Just my opinion. Too much CG, and you could see some volume. But, like, when it's action, it shines. When it's small character moments, it shines. But the other thing that I found cringy was the whole, like, forehead-to-forehead forehead thing that people do. Like, it's sort of a lesbian kiss. It's a, it's a, it's a woke kiss. Like, um, just kiss. What happened to a good movie? I, I would rather women hold their head together instead of kissing, honestly. Because when I see kissing, I'm definitely going to call it woke. I don't know what the hell you're saying or what you're thinking, but you're asking two women to kiss. That is straight up lesbianhood, therefore it's straight up wokeism. A kiss. Uh, although all I can think about is they're in the desert. They don't take baths. Um, they got a smell and their breath is pretty bad. Maybe that's why they don't kiss. But uh, so the thing is like seeing it a second time, the action, really good. Enjoyed it, loved it. The flaws were even more pronounced because I was like, oh, 
I gotta, I gotta sit through 40 minutes of her as a kid till we get to things really get started. And I could see how you cut it to two hours. There is a better movie that is shorter. So it, this is a mixed review. Um, like, I really love some things about it because I like Georgia Miller as a filmmaker. And some of it is great. Like, uh, she only has 30 lines in the whole movie. Mm -hmm. I saw someone complaining. They're going to complain about it. Oh, uh, Andy Taylor-Joy only has 30 lines. She's like Mad Max, didn't have very many lines at Road Warrior, right? And, and let's just say 28 of those lines are at the end of the movie. Right, right, right. So she doesn't talk much, but um, so that I don't mind. So there's, that's why this is mixed. They're like, oh, I really like a lot of aspects of it. Yeah. And then flaws, running time. Yeah, too damn running, long. Oh, dude, to, so like the beginning hours, and okay. then, then the ending with her, uh, I don't, I'm not going to give away. Not There is a, of course, this is, shouldn't surprise anybody, a final confr confrontation between, you know, Dementis and Furiosa. And wow, did that drag unnecessarily. So, you know, um, I'll say this. If the movie was shorter... I don't think I don't think it did. I actually do. I, okay, look. Look, Chris and Alan. If y'all are going to go to the movie theaters, be patient with movies. I understand it's... I understand sometimes movies can be long. Some are long, unnecessarily long. But this movie wasn't unnecessarily long because it's about this character it's building this character and, and, and helping us understand more of her backstory and actually making you getting getting you hopefully getting you to like furio some more in fury road up front i would have been okay with that ending i think the ending yeah. that her up front so you know um, i'll say this if the movie was shorter up front i would have been okay with that ending i think the ending yeah. The ending yeah. as it plays out, if if you were just to clip that ending, it, it's a pretty good ending. But the length of time you have to get there, it makes that scene feel long. I mean, this movie, the two and a half hours feels like two and a half hours. Right. Um, I, I will say this. The the thing, the the, the reason I would recommend this movie is the action. Um, the 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 cars, I mean, the, the, that's what Mad Max is. It's all these the car chases, the car battles. Um, you know, the, the torture <laughs> that goes on, uh, the way she loses her arm. I mean, that's, that's the reason you see this movie. That's the reason you'll buy your ticket and you, and you watch it. Everything yeah. else is just, you know, filler, uh, a lot of filler to get there. Uh, it's bloated. Um, but I think the action is worth it enough. My, my problem with the, uh, the heavy CG is that, um, it's so heavy that it makes the practical stunts look CG. And uh, that's my yes. that's that's the shame of it all, uh, and I, I get it. I, I think had they done it practically, the budget would have just blown up. Uh, there are shots in this movie that could kill people, and you know, yeah. so I get it. Uh, but um, the action is the reason to see it. I, I do like the. Part of the second, what do you say? Uh, there are shots in this movie that could kill people. Yeah. <laughs> Practical stunts look CG. And uh, that's my yes. that's that's the shame of it all, uh, and I, I get it. I, I think had they done it practically, the budget would have just blown up. Uh, there are shots in this movie that could kill people. Is the reason to see it. I, I do like the world building. I think more positive, and this upon you know a second viewing, some as much it's like oh okay, yeah. That's or you're, or you're more forgiving of them the second yeah. time. Yeah, less forgiving this time. Did not work, and let them as much. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I see the movie a second time. So a lot of times in movies, when I see flaws, I see the movie a second time. Mm -hmm. I don't notice them as much. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's. Or you're, or you're more forgiving of them the second yeah. time. Yeah, less forgiving this time. Did not work, and I don't know. It's barely a recommend. That means you know, see it, but see it. Uh, mm -hmm. Might be in that 19 day window. Georgia Miller shining through, but it's nearly as good as, as Fury Road. Now I'm told the next Mad Max movie will be a Mad Max movie. So yeah. we'll see Tom Hardy returning to that character. I hope they just wrap it up with a, a focus on him. And, you know, the Mad Max movies have all had really cool side characters, like from Road Warrior, you know. 
The Lord's humongous. Just walk away. Leave the gas. Just walk away. Like, all that stuff. Like, so many good... The gyro captain. There are really... They're ensemble movies with one focus. Get back to that. Get back to Max. Tell the ending of his story. And uh, mm -hmm. that's what I want to see. So it's it's a barely a recommend for me, but that, that, I could understand that Mad Max does need to be the one to finish this franchise since he started. But having like literally Furiosa is the only female lead in the entire that is the entirety of the Mad Max universe. She's the only female lead, and when I say female lead, she is the female protagonist while the male protagonist is of course Max Wakastansi. And Mad Max had Mad Max Wakastansi had two actors play him, Mill Gibson and Tom Hardy. And respectfully so, Furiosa has had two actors two actresses play her. Charlie Theron and now Anya Taylor Joy. There's nothing wrong with that. If anything, it's a balance between man and woman. You know, it's... I just know that people want something to hate. That's, that's why Furiosa is being picked on in the box office. That's why she's flopping. Is because people want something to hate. There's nothing... Really wrong with this movie. I keep looking back because I'm just being paranoid. I don't know why I'm being paranoid. I'm not, I'm not on drugs right now, but uh, maybe it's the eye drops. Like, I don't know. Anyway, um, I really can't help but repeat myself. I think this movie's fine. I just don't understand how people can just hate this movie unless you just are bored and don't have anything to do. Is the recession making people bored? Is that what it is? If anything, hey, looking for a job is a job in itself. If you want something to do, just look for a job. Putting random applications, even for jobs you don't qualify for or, or, or overqualify for. When I say recommend, like you could see it on VOD, you know, when it comes out. People's cars. I mean, that's, you know, women, women can do that and kill people with cars. I mean, that's, you know, women, women can do that. I mean, well, I don't know about the sniper part, but uh, um, everything else. The, the IMAX screening. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, some some man, usually a man. I mean, it's, it's rare that you see a female antagonist in these situations because they don't want a woman to look bad, you know. So it's all right. Well, we got to have a the male antagonist. I was actually surprised that the Marvels put a female villain in there, um, but then they even made her kind of sympathetic. So then you get these sympathetic villains. Yeah, like, it's just trash, man. villains are not villains. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're not villains Especially anymore. Female you know, so yeah, like, yeah. I mean, green, uh, and, and it's always done at the expense of male characters. They'll do this stuff, and then they'll make the men around them stupid, incompetent, or whatever. And it's like, come on, like who wants to watch that? You know, yeah. especially if you're putting this in an action setting with an adventure film or a comic book film or sci-fi, where it's primarily guys watching it anyway. You know, I don't get it. I don't finally it's the fact that just just by having this discussion, people just basically say, "Well, Derek and Alan, they're and um, the message." You know, the message is is that girls get it done and they can do everything a man can do in high heels and all that crap, and it's not true. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, girl, some women out there can't achieve what it is that they want to achieve, but men and women are fundamentally different. And to try to paint this picture that they're exactly the same is one of the major issues that's going on right now just in society at large. You know, it's like we have lived experiences, folks. I don't know if Hollywood is aware of this, but we walk amongst normal people out here, all right? We're not walking around Hollywood's bubble mm -hmm. where everybody thinks the same way. No, we have real lived experiences He's where like, we come across women and we come across men and we know what life is really like. And you guys are trying to push us all in a box to say you need to believe this way. But the world doesn't react that way, especially doesn't react that way outside of this country. You go to other countries. They're like, what is this? This, this doesn't make any sense <laughs> to me. You know, this is it, this is insane. But in this country, we try to try to, I don't know, put a a, a nice, you know, a appealing look on this whole concept that women are just as capable of men of doing a lot of different things almost just they're, you know yeah. the exact same and there's some things that women can do i'm not saying that there isn't obviously well, there's some I mean, things yeah. that women can do and men and everything and there's a lot of equality when it comes to that but you know what they try to portray in films a lot of times 
It's just like, come on, guys. You don't have like a yeah. you know a five foot one, hundred and five pound Angel, woman just kicking it. some guy's ass. It's like, yo, you really expect me to believe this? I don't care how yeah, much. Yeah, we'll get to Furiosa in a moment. <laughs> oh, okay. That's what I see. I haven't watched Furiosa, so I don't know if that's what's happening. But yeah, you, well, we'll, that's we'll a talk big about this. This is like almost two weeks ago. This was like ten days ago. So, so obviously this guy's seen it. I think relationship with Newt and going to save her at the end and everything that was happening. Like going back to Ripley. And her mothering instincts when it came to that film and with her home, again, it comes off differently. These are the values that they don't want people, to, I guess, to focus on when it comes to women. It's like, yo, this motherly instinct is very important. It's, va it's valuable in society. It's not And that's exactly what you see. That is exactly what you see in the first 30 minutes of the movie Furiosa, is that the mother, once again, played, uh, portrayed by actress... Charlie Fraser, who plays Mary Jabessa, the, the mother of Furiosa, she's going to save her, her daughter, her child. Like, that's that's what you have, is a motherly instinct. Something to just wash away. Oh, it's not important. It's, it's important that she can kick the alien queen's ass. That's important. But it's like, but being a mother to Newt is just as important in a lot of places, even more important. Not every little girl is going to run into the alien queen trying to kill her and lay eggs in her mouth, but every little girl needs a mom. And so it's like, why are we trying to push away this idea that this motherly, you know, like, but that's what we're seeing around now with this girl boss stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of women out there is, ah, I don't need to have a husband. I don't need a, a, a family and kids and all that. But then like, you know, nine times out of 10 towards the end of their lives, they're all like, man, I wish I had a kid. You know, I wish I had a family yeah. or this or that. You know, they have that instinct that's in them. And that's been built up through, again, millennia of society living a certain way. And now everybody just wants to go against the grain. And I'm, I'm like, I don't get it. OK, there's a way that the world has been built with society. Societies are built from families and civilizations are built from. It's like this is the way human the human race works. This is the way humanity works. And as mm -hmm. long as you push against that, you try to go in a completely different direction. It, it, this is what's going to happen. You're going to yeah. have failures. I mean, we saw how many girl boss failures lately, you know, with Madam Web and uh, what was the other one? Marvel, the Marvels failed. You had Birds of Prey. If, if only Madam Web did not come out this year, if it never came out at all, Furiosa would not be getting the heat that she's getting. I mean, sorry, the, the, the movie. All in the comic book genre. All of them failed. Failed. Uh, yeah, I want to kind of move forward and, and see more of a... Uh, I didn't know this. The Critical Drinker here apparently has this after show called Drinkers Chasers. He's this two ones. It's called Furiosa's and Mad Mixed Bag, and then you got Hollywood and Panic. This was a day ago. This this is like eight days ago. Let's, let's watch this one for I have seen Furiosa on Mad Max Saga, which is a terrible name for a movie that doesn't have Mad Max in it. I just want to point that out right away. Um, oh my god, it looks like he's got like a Star, Star Wars Stormtrooper kind of vibe. <laughs> I like it. it. Is it? I think it is. I think it maybe that's just it's a long sleeve. But yeah, I've seen it. Um, there's the good. Wait, wait, wait no. Uh, and the bad. I will say this: it's not overly woke in the sense that like the last film was. I did like Fury Road better. Just because this movie doesn't have woke elements doesn't mean it doesn't have flaws that's right true. off the bat. So um, the, the noticeable things that will annoy all of us oh, here. I love this. The I first 40 minutes is Furiosa as a 10-year-old. Straight right. up. That's it's a long like, preamble. Yeah, like, it, okay, maybe the first 10 minutes, 40 minutes of young and she's good the young actress is very good but did we need that much of a preamble no um i will say some fantastic action sequences one in particular in the very middle of the film and it is never topped at the end so you get this fantastic amazing action scene and then nothing comes close by the end of the movie and then the third act is dragged out with that typical it's a something new in hollywood um a second third act uh you talked friend, about this before yeah, yeah 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 my friend jim agnew is a screenwriter says every meeting he goes to they're like 
But what's the second third act? You don't need it. You don't need it. Um, it's too long by about 20 minutes at least. But I will say I don't think, and this will be maybe a point of controversy. I don't think Furiosa is a girl boss in the okay. way that it's been defined by the Marvel movies and other stuff. He gets her sh the shit kicked out of her the whole movie. In the same sense that, like, uh, in the first Raiders movie, Indiana Jones is, he gets his ass, he doesn't win. You know, he, he just survives. And she really gets her ass kicked the whole film. And oddly enough, he has a male mentor, another driver, and they get romantically entangled. But then they do this. It's a weird thing. I don't know how this is. Um, you know, in movies, when there's romantic interests and you see a male lead and a female lead and there's a moment and they kiss and you're like, oh, it's great. They like each other. They're they're and they care about each other. She, she um, it's right at the moment you're like, oh, this is the kiss. But they do this horrible thing they do in modern movies where they take, they go like, let's press our foreheads together. And the oh. foreheads together, that's like, instead of a kiss, it's so, I, I groaned when I saw it. It was they so bad. You're like, oh my God. And the way she loses her arm I'm fine with will be, uh, people will be discussing it, I believe. So, um, it's not what you think. Did she give a really quick hand job and it fell off? <laughs> well, I mean, she could have after, but... It friction you know, burned and just started to ignite. Kind of. Kind does, of. Does but, she have to, like, chop it off because it's stuck in a piece of machinery or something? Are you a writer, Will? <laughs> That's a crazy good idea that might have been used in the movie. I can't believe uh, you figured it out. Um, was she in a car what? crash and a pane of glass got stuck in her leg? <laughs> no, that Which was, made it lose her <laughs> off. It's been done. It's been done. But, you know, overall, I really enjoyed it. Not as much as Fury Road, but um, it's not without its flaws. But the thing is, I did like she get got her ass kicked every, so much in the movie. You feel for her. You know, you feel for her a lot. And that really saved it for me. So that that automatically puts it above ninety percent of what Hollywood produces nowadays, where they actually put a female character through some trials, and you feel bad for her as a result. Like, wow! Like that—that's the sort of thing that Disney and Marvel and stuff would never do. So it, that it's by itself is something. It's shocking, and th this male mentor, not even in the trailer, not even discussed. It's a huge part of the movie that she has this guy that's like. I'll teach you things. You know, the wasteland is, is brutal. But at the end, this is going to be a weird way to put it. How do I put this? It's like the movie does very well world building. You know, the bullet farm, gas town, you know, the, the characters we saw in Fury Road, how they get to the place that they are when Fury Road begins. So, but it feels like a season pass for a video game. Uh, as yeah. as we it's like here's the new levels and the fact that it's they're still calling it a mad max saga i hate that i freaking hate it um and there might be a cameo by max in the film so overall i enjoyed it but lower your expectations oh the one thing i really like too he has I, someone counts it he only has 30 lines in the whole movie what? Furiosa. Yeah, so yeah, Furiosa. 30 whole lines. So so she's very soft spoken, yeah. just like Max. I mean that, that's a hallmark for George Miller though, isn't it? Because like yeah. um you know, Fury Road was exactly the same. It was quite sparing with the dialogue. Yeah, he and Denis Villeneuve focus on the, the visuals. But I'll say this the spectacle is amazing. I mean, there is more CG in this. You know, um, than the last one, or at least noticeable CG. But I gotta say, like, some of the scenes, it felt like a silent film. Parts of the movie. There's so little dialogue. And I mean a silent film, like an old, like, 1920s biblical epic. So, I, I enjoyed it, and the flaws aren't because it's got some agenda, 
or message or wokeness. Um, the flaws of the movie are just bad movie. I mean, like, um, I hope we get to a place where you can just say this is a this movie isn't woke, but it's also not good. And I miss those days. What uh, What did you think of Anya Taylor Joy? <clears throat> um, He's very in good. Action role because I've never seen her really do action before. Right, she's very good, and she isn't. I mean, she's not strong. You see, you see her physically; she's wiry. I mean, any one of us could turn her into a pretzel. I mean, she's so. Yeah, she's but long she, she has different strengths, so she uses she's what so she long. has. She but she reminds me of the uh, the what is the long neck dinosaur called? But the uh, Brontosaurus, Brontosaurus. Just because her head is so small and her neck is so long, but also she kind of looks like a cat with big eyes. She also kind of reminds me of an alien. I like her, but I, I like I like the character. I think she's I think she's actress is obviously hot, attractive. Um, she she's got she's got this action packed vibe in this battle, and uh, I liked the moon I saw in uh, Split. With uh, she's playing alongside James McAvoy, the, the playing the character of Hoodwing and whatever the character is, and he got like twenty six different personalities. When I first saw in that movie Split, I was like, "This is a girl that I would have a crush on if I had met her in high school or even college. It should be an instant crush, just because of her brown hair and the way the symmetry of her face between the, this this between her nose and her eyes, and like she looks." Like she would be somebody's sweetheart. Like she'd be that alienated girl in high school, but also over time she would be that hot girl that people first hated when she was younger. But now that she's gone beyond puberty, they would just like her and be like, oh, I'm sorry we picked on you. You turned out to be a hot, hot throb. But anyway, yeah, uh, that's how she physically looks. As an action star, and she, she's known for playing different roles. She's been in several different projects, including in England and America. Uh, she was also in this in the, in the uh, movie uh, Amsterdam with with uh, Margot Robbie and the guy from Tenet. I forgot his name. I know it's something Washington. He's the son of Denzel Washington. Uh, she played a one of the one of the conniving uh, characters that ended up being arrested because they commit some type of. Uh, Fraudulent activity that, yeah, they get arrested for. But uh, anyway, that's sorry. Uh, let me get clearly outmatched physically by many uh, of the characters she's she goes up against. So make of that what you will. But a lot of people are going to say uh, they're going to be turned off, and they rightfully so, because girl boss stuff is so tired. It's so t Captain Marvel probably the worst or the Marvels. That movie was. God what did all. I say? What did I say? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is not as insufferable. I don't know if that's a positive, but... Yeah. Uh, Chris, I'll be honest. You're not, <laughs> you're not selling me with that yeah. line. I know, I know. You have not sold this film at all to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not trying to sell it. That's not my no, job. No, but, but you said, I enjoyed it, and then you just literally almost contradicted yourself with everything. It just I don't understand what you actually liked. Well, the, the middle, there's a great action sequence in the middle of the movie. There's a Where they cool take her and kick her off a building. He loved that Exactly. That <laughs> is. The, the first act dragged with the girl, and then the well, third act dragged. It's not terrible. It's just like <laughs> um, the, the, lead, the actress who plays her when she's like 10 years old is very good. And yep. it, it, it's really good, but you're like, it's not what this movie is. I wasn't sold that, you know? I think Ass has made a point. Like, you're just telling us the film is bad, but it's not woke. That's the selling point. Yeah. Well, no, but, like, I mean, some of the action scenes are just a jaw-dropping. Just really good. Um, hey, like, Fallout had some good scenes, but overall, it wasn't that great. And people were well, mad no, at it. Fallout, uh, I, I finally saw Fallout. That might be the worst season finale ever. That last episode oh. of Fallout... Hated it. Hated it. <laughs> the rest of the oh. season wasn't so great either. But I mean, <laughs> I'm with Mahler. I mean, yeah. I actually went to a an event where Christopher Christopher Nolan interviewed Jonathan, his brother, mm -hmm. talking about Fallout, and they so they say, well, it's a, it's a um, you know, it's an ensemble cast, 
that each represents different types of gamers. Huh? Lucy is like the casual right. gamer. The ghoul is the hardcore gamer. And then, uh, what's his name? Maximus is sort of like... He's, he's uh, the retarded gamer. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, was it inter interesting he's the guy with down. It's, it's <laughs> video goes on my channel, but... Uh, <clears throat> but no, I look, I, it's not as good as Fury Road, but I'll take bad Georgia Miller over good Nia DaCosta. You know what I'm saying? Like, what do we got yeah. this summer? Um, I mean, uh, yeah. Do you, in terms of its box office prospects, like, what do you imagine this movie's going to do? Because we're still waiting for like that big box office hit to kick off the, the summer Deadpool. movie season, Deadpool. and it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, it might be Garfield. Garfield. Because oh, that movie oh, is. Me. It looks so. I mean, it. I, I, I've heard, talked to people, seen it. It's terrible. But it's not super heavy. It's like one of those minions movies. You know, you're like, why did yeah. minions did so did so well? Because you know, people go see that. But I do think that the brand of going to the theater and seeing a big movie is tarnished. Look at Fall Guy. Nin yeah, we just talked about that earlier. Yeah. Nineteen days after it opened in theaters, you can get it on VOD and yeah. the extended cut. 20 minutes longer. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. It's a good, yeah. it's a fun film. Uh, the Fall Same. Guy was a really fun film. I, I had no real complaints with it. It's not particularly sophisticated, and the plot's got a few holes in it, but, like, it's fun enough and pretty inoffensive, and the cast are likable. The action scenes are okay. It, it just seemed like... 30 million, man. Yeah. Yeah. You could have done yeah. it for half that for what you actually get in it. Yeah, I mean, I did like it was entertaining as hell, but you know, I don't know why it didn't click. It's, the it's a rom com. Yeah. It's a rom com. Yeah. You, you don't you can't have a hundred and thirty million dollar rom com which has gotta make three hundred and ninety million to make its money back. It's not how rom coms work. Rom coms are cheap movies so you, so the guy can take his missus to the cinema to get his fucking dick sucked later because he did something nice for her. That's what. The, that's the whole purpose of a rom-com. Well, that was back in the early 2000s. It's to, it's to, yeah, it's, yeah. It's to con the woman. It's to con the woman into thinking the man's doing something nice, so he can get something out of it. This is how I know ass is out of touch with the current generation. Yeah. TikTok <laughs> women have taught me that you literally have to do the bare minimum and take them to an expensive <laughs> Italian restaurant <laughs> just for you to get a good review on her social media. <laughs> Hey guys, I just went out with this hot dude and we went out to this wonderful Italian restaurant. You're not going to get any from a girl. We're going to see Ryan Reynolds. Or wait, no, other white guy. Uh, guy and Gosling. Yeah. Guy, <laughs> guy and Gosling. <laughs> In another film. Please blow me. As says it works. <laughs> well, look, I think at the end, this is going to get mixed reviews. You're going to see it. And you can't deny this action sequence was, was great, but then why this and why that? So it's a mixed bag, which is most movies, the movies these days. Hello, I'm David Miliband, president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Our humanitarian focus is on the needs of civilians in Gaza. Many have lost their houses, lost relatives, lost friends. And our commitment is to do everything we can to help those civilians survive and recover from the crisis. The immediate needs that we're trying to meet through our team that is based in Egypt, but also through our partners on the ground inside Gaza, is to add our expertise when it comes to containing communicable disease, addressing Okay, so this was the other half of the Drinkers Chasers. Uh, Dr Drinkers Chasers. Furiosa came out just barely oh, even I a week like ago. That. Weeple, Weeple from uh, what is that? What is that game? I never finished. I actually had fun. Uh, this is an Xbox game. Weeple video game. Video game. Oh shit! Gotta get used to this keyboard. Why don't you Logitech while this keyboard? Not Whipple. Is 
So it's called death. Ah, uh, Rim, sorry. What's wrong with that typing? Game. Forget what it's called. It's a game on the Xbox. Is this one right here? Dark Siders. Dark Siders. That's what the game is called. Just let me confirm. Dark Siders. I actually think it's Dark Siders too. Where is the prequel? Where's the sequel? Sequel, sequel, sequel. Among them are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the last of the Nephilim, who are tasked to bring balance to the universe. Uh, oh, here's the second one, yeah. This is the one I played on Xbox. I played the Definitive Edition. It was actually pretty fun. I never finished it. But you played the character Death. But that's essentially what his avatar is. And massively underperformed in its opening weekend. I think they were initially projecting something like 70, 80 million for its more, uh, Memorial Day opening weekend. Ended up coming in at like 31 million. So mm -hmm. way underperforming. And I think it's now, according to Box Office Mojo, it's sitting at about 68 million worldwide against a budget of 160 million. Now, one of the questions uh, that so I, I think it's asked more times is, than I can remember is... At the very drinker. least, going to underperform, seriously, and possibly just be a, an all-out bomb. And it's going to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Hundreds of millions. Yeah. And it's kind of joining the ranks of so many other movies recently, like The Fall Guy, you know, like... Um, what was the other one that was... Who, um, that kind of underperformed? You talking about If... And Planet of the Apes? Planet of the Apes, that was it, Planet yeah. Planet of the Apes, yeah. So, you know, all, like, relatively crowd-pleasing movies with a, a sort of a proven track record, at least in Planet of the Apes' case, um, all underperforming. And I guess I'm kind of wondering why, um, like, whether this points to, like, a bigger problem for the summer movie season ahead, and just, I don't know, are people just not interested in movies at the moment? Well, I think, I think people... Like a, oh, like a couple ahead, of things. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, like, a couple of things, like... In general, people are not really going to the movies that much in general since the COVID was, has happened and is over now. Yeah. Uh, then Mad Max movie, which is not about Mad Max. I think there's a whole other people who are like, I don't really care about other characters that much. I mean, Furiosa wasn't the uh, wasn't Fury Road, so yeah, Tom I guess Hardy like from The Dark Knight maybe. Rises to Inception and Mad Max has done some of the biggest roles the last 15 years. But he said, looking back, he has one big regret. In 2015, Tom Hardy did the movie Mad Max Fury Row, which made $380 million on a budget of $185 million and got critical acclaim with a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Even though Tom Hardy said he wanted to do a sequel to the movie, the reason this never happened was him and Charlie's Theron feuded heavily on set. The issue was the two actors had very different work styles, where Tom Hardy would like to come in late while Charlie's Theron would like to be on time, and Tom Hardy was more spur of the moment while Charlie's Theron wanted to be organized. Charlie's Theron said she didn't feel safe working on the Mad Max set, saying it was about 90% men and she demanded a female producer to make her feel more represented. Her co star Zoe Kravitz agreed, saying they felt isolated now that's woke doing the movie because there were very few women on set and they didn't know how to address certain issues. While many fans so apparently there's a new filter that shows you what you look like when you grow up and I don't know how accurate it's going to be. Let, let me try it out. Tom Hardy from The Dark Knight Rises to Inception and Mad Max has done some of the 
the biggest roles the last 15 years, but he said looking back, he has one big regret. In 2015, Tom Hardy did the movie Mad Max Fury Road, which made $380 million on a budget of $185 million and got critical acclaim with a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Even though Tom Hardy said he wanted to do a sequel to the movie, the reason this never happened was him and Charlize Theron feuded heavily on set. The issue was the two actors had very different work styles, where Tom Hardy would like to come in late while Charlize Theron would like to be on time, and Tom Hardy was more spur of the moment while Charlize Theron wanted to be organized. Charlize Theron said she didn't feel safe working on the Mad Max set, saying it was about 90% men and she demanded a female producer to make her feel more represented. Her co-star Zoe Kravitz agreed, saying they felt isolated doing the movie because there were very few women on set and they didn't know how to address certain issues. While many fans have blamed Charlize Theron for not getting a sequel saying she overreacted, Tom Hardy has come out taking the blame for the situation, saying everyone was in over their head because of the difficulty filming some of the scenes and he had some freak out moments that did make Charlize feel unsafe. He did apologize to Theron and said we're probably not getting a sequel, and with that I'm Charles Perrault, subscribe to learn something. Tom Hardy from The Dark Knight Rises to Inception and Mad Max that that's kind of work right there. If, if they don't feel like they're, they're doing their job, and it's mostly men. I mean, Hollywood is a man-dominated industry, like so many others. It's just how it is. Yeah. But then I think the biggest thing is they just released the movies three weeks after on digital nowadays. It's like, oh, they didn't do well in the first two days. We're just going to release them in three weeks, and you that's can just watch them at home. And if I had the choice, and I'm not going to talk about them day one or something, it's like, I'm just going to wait and just watch them on my telly, on my couch, and uh, actually pause the movie and go have a leak, because the movie is 17 hours long every time. <laughs> <laughs> I think, no, I think that's a real... Yeah. Furiosa was going for in the second film. Um, right. The movie starts off there. So I'm not spoiling anything. This is the opening moments of the movie. Yeah. It's in the trailer. Like, from the beginning, you see her in this place. And it felt like a, a prequel comic. I don't need to know any of this, but it really expands on the world of Mad Max. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I actually enjoyed it, except, okay, now we got to go. Well, we should talk about things that we liked first. Yeah. But I, I, there are things that were problems for me, mainly running time. Running time. I mean, the first sequence in the middle of the movie that's so good almost no words are spoken mm -hmm. and it's so incredible it's like we've seen some of that before never seen it this good yeah it's so good and um uh nothing tops it and that's a problem this big sequence in the middle is so epic are you talking about the chase or are you talking about yeah the yeah, yeah okay and it's like n afterwards, it's like they're great sequences after, but not as good. Okay, uh, what do you guys think? Oh, I, th I, th I think you can't beat the action in this movie, man. Um, it's George yeah. Miller. So, like I said, if, if you love Three Road, you're gonna love this. Uh, I love honestly. I really just love the world building of this uh, movie. Like you know, we we finally like I fi I feel like I finally understand the Mad Max movies more because of this movie, right? It explains the lore. It explains the, the back history. Uh, you just get a better idea of how this world works, you know, through its economy, how, how their economy works, how, um, who's running things like the bosses, right? Of the wasteland. It, it, it just gives you a real broad view of how Mad Max works and i i think on that level i really loved it because for me it felt a little bit kind of like an rpg uh like i'm playing an <laughs> rpg right because you're just yeah. exploring this world and honestly wouldn't be a bad idea for an rpg if they decided to do it right yeah um just just being able to create a character in that world and and go about it and i i i just feel like it is it the best movie i've seen probably not but it's it's, it's enjoyable when i go see it again Oh yeah, I absolutely I'll see it again. Yeah. So for me, for me, that it. alone, the fact that I will see it again, uh, tells me it's a good film. Yeah. Alan. Yeah, my my kid was like, Is it like Dune? I go kind of, and then she goes, Oh, okay, I'll see it then. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I the action. The action is the best part of this movie. Yeah, and I and quite frankly, the action is the best Hands part down. of all the Mad Max movies. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that's a no brainer there. Um I do. I do like the fact that in Fury Road, um, this this land of abundance is uh, is a dream uh, that she she strives for, and that she uh, never spoiler she never really gets there. Um, 
and I, I like the fact that he started off there, that the, that this place does exist, because I think that that raises the stakes uh, for Furiosa in this movie. Good intro. Uh, why she is so desperate to get back, and and I like the fact that uh, that it happened in this movie and not in Fury Road. Um, I also think that this is probably one of the best prequels uh, that you'll see in a very long time. Um, for some reason, he just he just he was able to he was able to to keep the tone, keep the visual style in in place, keep the action the way the action is shot. It, it just feels like a very you know it it feels like a you know definitely a, a story same story as uh, Fury Road, but um, he handles the setup for. Uh, you know, the prequel stuff. Uh, he sets it up really well in this one to where you can naturally move into the next one, which weirdly enough, you do at the end of the movie. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. The prequel stuff, it like, because yeah. we see a lot of the characters from in mm -hmm. Fury Road in this, you know, younger versions and where yeah. they came from and why they are where they are. Yeah. So it was kind of satis satisfying. Um, mm -hmm. In that regard, so yeah, and I mean, it can't be understated the action, like stuff that it's just so it's like it's like a uh, a uh, uh, poetic or just like ballet. It's just so well done, you know. And the war boys and the fact that it's more of the lore of you know different the different factions, right, and how they work. And um, Morton Joe's sons. Grotus and Rectus. <laughs> Was it Rectus? Am I right? Erect yes, Grotus like, and Rectus. <laughs> I am Scrotus. <laughs> you're like, okay. And and I'm Rectus. And you're like... <laughs> it was just hysterical. Like Now I'm understanding it. So I was kind of thinking, is there something sexual going on with the name? Like, if his name had been Erectus... I can understand it, because, you know, like, men erect, and penis enlargement. But scrotus, I, I was like, I don't know if that's sexual or not, but now that I know, scrotum being that has, houses the testicles, and being rectus, kind of the short version of saying erectus, you know, erect the penis. You know, it only points to what uh, uh, Dementus said earlier. He said, um, we know which which of you had the testes to do this little... Um, 
Dance of Darwin that he did at, at, at towards the, like the first within the first forty minutes of the film. Where the world had gone, and there's also this really cool. Um, this is why I compare it to a comic, like chapters. It'll say, say like one, and it says there's like <laughs> five or six chapters that kind of. Uh, that's what made the movie feel long because it's no, like oh, I like four. that. We're I like chapter, that. We're at five now. We're at chapter five. <laughs> I thought that worked. If they could, if they could have turned this movie down to just uh, an even two hours, I, I think it'd be perfect. It, it would be, be a perfect, perfect movie. Perfect. I, I, I don't think the thirty yeah. minutes extra uh, helps this film at all. Yeah, agree. I, I mean, once Anya Taylor Joy shows up, I'm thinking to myself, "Oh, is this the halfway point in the movie?" And I'm like, it was "I just forty went, minutes in, around forty minutes in." I know, but it it it, it feels like two and a half hours. Right, uh, and right. that just, you know, the, the fact that I'm looking at my watch, uh, wondering what time it is, says a lot about, you know, it, you know, it not being a great film, but being a good film. Yeah, well, look, I, in spite of the flaws, the running time, huge flaw, mm -hmm. huge flaw for me. But also, I got to say the, the the actress that played the younger one did a pretty damn good job. Man. Yeah, I, I, I feel like almost kind of upstages uh, Anya Taylor Joy. I know, I know. It's like I, I was really getting into her performance, and then Anya Taylor Joy shows up. It's like okay, well that's over. But I agree <laughs> with you, Alan. In terms of a prequel, I can't think of many prequels that hold up. Mm -hmm. This really did a good job as a prequel. But it begs a question um, that I've always thought about, like uh, the character of Boba Fett in Star Wars. Okay, think about it. Yeah, such a beloved character, Boba Fett. But you know, after uh, Empire and Jedi, the the thing that made Boba Fett cool was you didn't know anything about Boba Fett, and what a prequel can do is take the mystery. of something that's cool and ruin it by telling you everything you need to know um i don't feel that way in the is take the mystery of something that's cool and ruin it by telling you everything you need to know um, I don't feel that way in this case, but I yeah. think that that's what, how where prequels go wrong. So, uh, yeah, I, I, and that's why I'm saying I, I'm glad they opened up in the in the land of abundance, and, and so so that abundance. when she chases the MacGuffin, uh, yeah. cha you know the return there, you know it's real, and, and that raises the stakes in it, and then the tragedy of the fact that she won't reach it at the end of the movie. Or does she? Or does she? Exactly. Well, no, you know because you've seen the, you've seen Fury, Fury Road. Well, this just makes me want to watch Fury Road. She reaches, she yeah. reaches Honestly. it, but it's gone. So, all right, yeah, I have a few right. more. The green place well, yeah, I wonder if that's why they put clips of Fury Road in, during the credits of this movie. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I think it's yeah, just to kind of remind the audience that yeah. oh yeah, this is a prequel to this movie. Yeah, yeah. It's and, and that Fury Road, Road is on Max. Go see it. And then maybe it's maybe so subscribe. Right. Yeah. It was yeah. a sad <laughs> Sorry, it was a marketing strategy and a type of branding that indeed worked. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you do it the right way without trying to have any type of political or agenda message. There's nothing wrong with it. So there's, there's more something wrong with people who just finding reasons to hate it, including its timing. Uh, the fact that it doesn't have Mel Gibson as the lead role of Mad Max, 
uh, AK Max Club Stancy. And not need it. I don't know why people keep saying that. Um, and yeah, that this this really. I'm sorry. That's just all I have to say about that. I can't go more in depth about how I don't understand why people don't like this movie. Uh, once again, people just hate it because they want to hate something because the board because they want to do away with all the fact that both people including the boss that they did the girl boss. Uh, and it's just not working anymore. It's not not working for them. It's it's not working for the movie, and so they 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 quit doing it. That's why that in. and Fury Road just really amped it up, uh, huge. But the stories are uh, aside from the first Mad Max. All the other Mad Max stories aren't really about Mad Max. They're about the places he goes and the people he interacts with there. And yeah. Fury Road was one of them, and a lot of people complained, and justifiably so, that you know, no Mel Gibson and um, Tom Hardy was okay, and you know, the, the, I thought the plot was bad because they they were just about Mad Max. They're about the places he goes and the people he interacts with there. And yeah. Fury Road was one of them, and a lot of people complained, and justifiably so, that you know, no Mel Gibson and um, Tom Hardy was okay, and you know, the, the I thought the plot was bad because they they were just mm -hmm. driving out and then to turn around and drive back. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you guys kids in the back don't calm down, I'm turning this car around. That is literally Fury Road. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, and I don't remember him having necessarily a character arc. Uh, no, I just saw know. him as a guy going through going through hell and coming out on top in the end. Yeah, cause, uh, like the man with no name has more of a character arc in, in the Fistful of Dollars uh, trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, Mad Max, he's just he's a facilitator. He's this guy that kind of does things, but the story is really the setting and those characters there right. in each and every movie. It's part of his anthology approach. I think the fact that George Miller, for some reason, decided to add a Mad Max story to Furiosa is what's causing a lot of people to be apprehensive of watching it because yeah. – you're essentially saying it's a Mad Max story, but it's about Furiosa before Mad Max meets Furiosa. It's like, no, just sell us on Furiosa. Try it, try, mm -hmm. try it that way. And do, cause again, this is what he's doing. He has actually picked one setting that he really liked recently with the Fury Road. And he's doing another movie in that setting, which he's never done before with Mad Max. We've never gone back to the, to the village in, in the road warrior. We've never gone back to the, the village of, of Thunderdome, but this is the first time we were going back to this world. So there's something to it there that um, that uh, George Miller really really liked. Yeah, and I mean, I'll, I'll definitely say that the the world building in this one is uh, that I think that's what intrigued me more about this about Furiosa than about Fury Road. That mm -hmm. that I'm getting a sense of this world, who the players are, and it makes more sense when you go into Fury Road, uh, the motivations of these certain factions. Um, let, yeah, let, I saw Robert Meyer Burnett tweeted, retweeted somebody who did an analysis on this, and he basically said Furiosa shouldn't be its own standalone movie. It should be a complementary film to Fury Road, like the how the Animatrix was to the Matrix trilogy. Yeah, like that's how it was supposed should have been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know, I'll say it. It's to me, it was a very good prequel. It's probably one of the better pre prequels. Uh, you know, as much as we hate prequels, this is probably one of the better ones. And, and only because it it does lead into the next movie uh, without feeling forced, um, you know when she when uh, Furiosa and Fury Road was was uh, hoping to find was you know the quest was to find the green the, the find the the world of abundance, mm -hmm. and um, and in that movie it was kind of this this dream this legend, but in this movie it you know you actually feel that you actually see the real place that this was an actual location, and that her. Furiosa's journey was to basically return to Eden, and that was her lifelong journey, and I kind of like that. Um, let me ask you this question, though, um, and then I'll give you my theory as to why Furiosa and films like it aren't working, but um, what, what's striking and what's telling about Furiosa and The Fall Guy is that word of mouth is not working anymore, because uh, mm -hmm. you have two ostensibly good movies with good buzz but that buzz is not drawing people back into theaters. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think it's it, it's actually antithetical to what you need in marketing because marketing is tr the entire purpose of marketing is to get people to talk about it, which is dependent on word of mouth because that is the best form of getting people into the theater or getting people to buy or do anything is word of mouth. 
So the fact that we've had, a, a, I guess, a decade of movies that were mixed and underperformed and also kind of hoodwinked audiences has created a, a pattern to basically be very cautious about how reliable word of mouth can be these days. Because there's tons of word of mouth with Star Wars The Force Awakens, but I didn't see it in theaters because I hated J.J. Abrams. And when <laughs> I did finally see it, I'm like, this is terrible. How did this make, you know, two billion dollars <laughs> in the box <laughs> office? Um, but again, it, it comes down to word of mouth and word of mouth allows for you to get your first opening box office weekend. But it's now up to the product to make people want to come back and see it again. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think. think Oh, go ahead. Go, yeah, I'll, I'll just say I think it's been really hard with the way Hollywood has been um, producing these tentpole films to focus on the repeat viewing aspect of it. Sometimes yeah. things are so on the nose and so direct that you get it in one watch and you're like, oh, okay. And then there's no substance to it. There's nothing else there to make you think or want to go back and see again or maybe be like, oh, people were laughing at that part, but it was funny and I didn't quite get all of it. So I want to, and I really enjoyed it. So I want to go back and see it again. So maybe I can catch what was said there. So I don't have to wait for it to, you know, back in the day, be wait for it on video, but now it's streaming. And then studios are rushing to the streaming platform because they think that's where the audience is nowadays. Yeah. Well, I'll also say, look, you're a member of WGA, so uh, you're, you're included in this thought, but um, you know, it, it, the, the strike, both, both strikes, um, mm -hmm. You know, as much as it was about uh, you guys and the studios fighting over it, you know, it's it's the audience that I think, you know, even it happens with every strike. The audience is just fed up with uh, with, you know, these entities fighting amongst themselves and the audience just watching it and, and realizing that, uh, you know, maybe the products that they're fighting over is not that good and not. You know, and because oh, yeah. what what has been post strike? You know, after after Barbie and Oppenheimer, what was the what was the big hit? And, and it feels like everything that came out after Oppenheimer and Barbie uh, just underperformed and and it just hasn't recovered. And I think I think the audiences kind of resent the you know the WGA SAG and the producers for putting us into this position. Um, well, there's a couple of factors in there. The first one is that um, uh, there's not enough elapsed time has come for there to be put into production a post-strike film. Like everything else is just picked up where it left off, right? Because we struck right. for seven but, months. But you even the films that were done before the strike underperformed. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm, I'm well, drawing I mean, the line no, right no. At, at July when oh, Oppenheimer yeah, yeah. came out. And then after that, you know, you still had movies coming out, mm -hmm. uh, but they all underperformed. They all underperformed, and I, this goes back to the 2007 strike, which is that for some strange reason, um, the representatives of the WGA don't know how to market their own strike properly because mm -hmm. they always focus on the money. And while that's an important part and definitely a motivator, the real problem was that they didn't convey the fact that um, in the 07 strike was about uh, web streaming and the new medium delivery system of content to users and how the studios were trying to cut corners and circumvent pay across the board to pump out weaker quality content and by way of because reality tv had started taking off and that was what really drew audiences in and that's where the market kind of leaned towards so it, it's a very reciprocal relationship whatever the audience starts to gravitating towards the market will gear towards even if it's a fad which reality TV is to a degree, the market will hold on to it and try to exploit that and stretch it out as long as they could because it's considered easier money than the creative side of things. And mm -hmm. that's what the strike 07 strike was kind of about. But the WGA at the time, and I wasn't a member yet, um, did not know how to market that, which is silly because they're writers. They should know how to sell an idea. But again, the, some of the higher ups that were at WGA mm -hmm. at the time didn't know how to do that properly. The most recent strike um, had a very different approach, but it still had some of the older generation saying the dumb stuff about greed, money, and all that stuff. It wasn't about that. It was really about cutting. It was about saving technically California um, because California's economy is dependent on the film industry. And if you get rid of the creative aspect of the film industry, you're not making any movies. You're not making any television shows. You're Shows you're if you're doing it with generative AI and it's all going to be corporate stuff, the corporate stuff yeah. that people audiences haven't been responding to, which is what we've been seeing for the past few years. If that's going to be the new Hollywood, the writers were fighting against that because a lot of them were being pushed out um, 
because they were a little difficult to work with when they said, we want to do, we want to do a prequel to Willy Wonka. Well, you're going to have a, a lot of writers saying, okay, well, let's do that. And then you're going to have a lot more experienced writers saying, why? I, I've got an original story that could be just as whimsical and fun and magical as Willy Wonka. Why don't we do that? Make a new IP, make new money. Marketing gets involved and says, well, that's a higher risk factor. We, people already know Willy Wonka, so we want to go with that. In which case, the derivative now becomes primary, and it hurts the rest of the industry. When, But they got very lucky with Willy Wonka because that was, I guess, post-strike. That did really well at the box office mm -hmm. for Warner Brothers. Um, but it, it's the fact that you have the studio system and even the smaller mm -hmm. production houses and studios just not wanting to take the risk anymore. And they have a complete misunderstanding of how things work. When they change the TV model to the streaming model, our television shows, we got way more of them, but they also yeah. got really bad. And the good ones were harder to find because you got oversaturated with so much stuff that even if you find something that's good, it's hard for people to latch onto because they just don't have the time. They're, they're spending more time scrolling through the streaming service like a Netflix or a Max or Disney Plus than they are watching the content that's on there. Yeah. There's no, I, I can identify with that. There, there are times where it's like, oh, I just want to watch something that. before I go to bed. Yeah. And then I'm scr I'm sc scrolling through all these movies and <laughs> I'm just kind of paralyzed. I don't know what to watch. Uh, do I want to see this movie again or do I want to try a movie that I've never seen again? And I just wind up going to bed and not watching yeah. anything. Yeah, and, and yep. we had 600 new shows last year. That's a lot. That's more than we've ever had before. And on mm -hmm. average, when I was starting out, on average, you get 100 new shows a year five or 10% of those would luck would make it to series. But yeah. now we're getting 600 new shows. Um, a third of those are network and the rest are streaming and they're already bought and paid for prior to release, yeah. which means they're not even tested. And then they tank and they cost way much money and the writers and the writer strike. One of the aspects that I really never expected them to do was basically say, we don't want that prepaid system anymore. We want to do a pilot season. We want to pitch a pilot, get it tested and earn it to be put, put to series or put to the mm -hmm. first 13. And I'm like, I've never seen a union want to do that because it's it's slightly less guaranteed work, but it's there. And then they threw in the uh, residual sections yeah. saying that, yeah, yeah the more it succeeds, you, you succeed. Yes. And it's like, well, that's a meritocracy stipulation, which means that anyone that can't write a show that could do well is not going to be getting hired. And that's going to spread faster than any other type of reputation you have um, there. Like, yes, the top 20% of writers are always working because they're, they've are they earned that spot. And the bottom 80% struggle to get a job because yeah. they're networking and they're developing their skills. And then for the last decade, we've had people that didn't know how to write, but they've checked all these other boxes and they were thrown into the writer's room and they gave us garbage. All right. And it was, yeah, go and ahead. That, that was all the crazy stuff there. And I think that goes into the problem with Furiosa is because we've been exposed to so much garbage mm -hmm. Uh, that audiences are justified in being apprehensive over to what they want to watch, especially when they're seeing a framework of Furiosa that matches a lot of other frameworks that were terrible, that insulted audiences' intelligence and did not entertain and were more about preaching and whatnot. And I thought Furiosa was an interesting character from Fury Road, even mm -hmm. though, I mean, I wasn't the biggest fan of the movie, but I, I dug it for what it was. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm, I'm going to bring, we're going to talk about an article that came out in the LA Times uh, last week, uh, and, and it's dealing dir directly with the writers, but I, I do want to talk about a few other things before that. But uh, I have this theory about not only just Furiosa, but this trend toward female-led uh, action movies or female-led mm -hmm. movies. And the, the theory is, is that um, you know, when, when you look at Furiosa and you compare it to a movie like, you know, back in the old days with Stallone and, and Schwarzenegger and why, uh, why those movies worked and why Furiosa didn't or why the appeal wasn't there for audiences. And, and part of me feels like that the, the problem with a female protagonist is the fact that there are rules and limitations placed upon the way you present a female protagonist. For example, in Furiosa, there was an exert. There was a, an effort to keep Furiosa as virginal as possible throughout the film, in terms of, you know, don't touch her, don't violate her, um, and this was this was a part of that. And and to me, it was, you know, to me, you're thinking in your head, yeah, because if they did do something to her, you'd have feminist groups uh, calling the the show misogynist. You know, you don't treat women like that, and and that got me thinking that the one of the problems with having female protagonists today 
is the fact that you can't go in certain directions with them, uh, you know, in terms of nudity, in terms of violence, um, that they are just forbidden things. And, and for me, uh, as a comedian who, who performs family-friendly comedy on stage, I know full well the, um, the problems of comedian. placing limitations on creativity. I didn't, know Alan, I didn't know Alan was a comedian. Creativity. Uh, you know, the, the fact that I think we've gotten to a point where we can't, where we're drawing lines and as writers and creatives in, in, the, in the writer's room, you can't cross those lines. And for me, when you have a female protagonist, there are so many lines you can't cross that now you're, you're creating stories that, um, that, uh, that just don't feel challenging enough or, or don't, uh, you don't feel like the stakes are high enough in movies that are led by females versus males. Because... Quite frankly, you could torture a man. You could torture male characters. You could do horrible things to them and get away with it in movies. You just can't do that with females. It, it, do you feel like? Uh, do you? Do you have any? Do you think my uh, my theory has any validity? Um, partially, but there, there's one caveat to that, which is you can never really truly put restrictions on creativity because creativity finds a way around them. That's what the, that's the mar hallmark of creativity. I mean, look no further than All in the Family. There's a lot of things that they managed to get away with that otherwise you, you'd you know if they'd said it directly, you wouldn't be able to get away with it. Right. Same thing could, you, could you do that today? You can if you're smart enough. And that's the problem. Right. Like how many uh, of the newer uh, writers are actually going back to the history of film and television to understand how they managed to get away with those things mm -hmm. and, and how they were able to do it to the point where it appeased the people that are putting on those restrictions because – a lot of the people that are putting on those restrictions, um, their only agenda is that they just don't want to get phone calls from upset parents. Yeah, That's or they don't. Want they don't know the history of uh, movies, filmmaking, cinema. Twitter to blow up, uh, uh, or something of that nature. Like that's the only real reason why they do it. Mm -hmm. They otherwise don't care. They're just as dirty and filthy as the rest of us. Um, but they are also, they put those on there as for two caveats. One, to cover their butts. And two, to see, okay, is this writer creative enough where if we want to do a torture scene with a woman, they can find another way, an allegorical way to do that. Um, there are ways you can do it. I mean, look, one of the things I loved about the exploitation films is that Pam Greer, she she got assaulted, with un mm -hmm. like unapologetically so. And, but she, you know, her character came back and basically mm -hmm. got her vengeance. Um, it's a great, those are great films and you can right. do it. The thing is, how do you do it to the point where it's not gratuitous? It's not exploitation. Cause we, we had movies like I spit on your grave had, had a scene. So, so like that. And yeah. that was a revenge film. We, there was even a, another one. Um, I was like five or six years ago. Uh, I think the woman who played Tomb Raider, I think that's how she got the role to play Tomb Raider. It's like, she was like a, a side piece. Her character was that she was a side piece. And then they decided to leave her out in the middle of the woods or middle mm -hmm. of the desert to let her die. And then she came back and killed the men that did all that stuff. To yeah. her. The thing is, is that those are the types of stories that don't quite resonate overall with the audience that they're targeting, because I don't think they understand what audience they are targeting. They think, Oh, a female led, movie is going to bring in the female audience well no um know it, it's still going to bring in the male audience and you have to write with that in mind and as some of the times when they write it in that mind they don't write the female character as a female character they just write a masculine character and put the female veneer over top of it and that is inauthentic and it doesn't work that's why I mean, the most two famous female women we have is Ripley and Sarah Connor. The reason that they work is because they're mothers and they're doing stuff for their children. Like, that's the connection. That's how you justify it. That's the suspension of disbelief that um, you can make. When you're yeah. giving us a single woman, young, nothing, there's no stakes to them aside from their, their quote-unquote virginity or purity. And that is, not, that is not a personal connection. You have to do something stronger. Um, yeah. you have to, but, yeah. Well, let, like, let me, let me challenge you on this, on this point. Cause oh, I, I, you know, you, the, the, the point you're making is creatively you can work around it. And, um, and I would, I would question what, you know, why, why do we need to work around it? But the, but the other thing is, I, I feel like that it's not just from a creative standpoint, but it's from also the, the target audience standpoint is that maybe that's why men don't, men aren't seeing Furiosa versus Mad Max. 
is because there's a female protagonist, because there are limitations put on that female t- protagonist, therefore the action and the story is going to be limited. And, and to the point where men are just not, the, the men who are, let's be real, the, who, are, who are supposed to be the predominant audience for this, the ones shelling out the money, is that maybe that's the reason they're shying away from Furiosa versus if you had put a, a you know, Mel Gibson as Mad Max in this movie. Well, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, Mel Gibson and Mad, Mad Max, you know, that brings in the nostalgia to the character, brings in a little bit more authenticity to the to the project, uh, and it piques our interest. The, I think what hurts it is the fact that um, Furiosa isn't doesn't become an interesting character until this movie. So how she was presented in Fury Road didn't make me really want to see a movie about her. She was. I, I want to see more about Imogen Joe. Like, give mm-hmm. me that. Right, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't care about that, Furiosa yeah. and what her plight is and, and whatnot. See, see, that's what I think the people are going to do. I think, I think that George Miller is is is, is going to use Furiosa as inspiration for him to build on characters such as Nuke, uh, or sorry, Nux, um, Immortan Joe, and even Rectus and Scutus. Like those characters are going to get more, uh, more screen time. More backstories because Morton Joe dies in Fury Road, so so the only way the only route to go about his character at all is is an origin story for Immortan Joe. And I'll be honest with you, that movie should be short. That movie should be not even two hours. That should be at best an hour and a half. That's it. Maybe even an hour, yeah, about an hour and a half. No more than an hour and a half. Exactly. 90 minutes if there's a Morton Joe because you know or even Dementus like if you were to do a, a story about him no longer than an hour and a half because there's just no meat to the story other than okay they were driven crazy because of situations though families were killed blah 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 they were forced to think as scavengers and ultimately leaders and take over, Morton Joe took over the Citadel, he found it, and if they would have created a Morton Joe movie, obviously they would use the, the comic book that came out, telling about how he found the Citadel, and how he took it over, and established it as a stronghold, um, the primary fortress in Furiosa, Mad Max saga, um, but yeah, I, I think they should go that route not there was something absent it was it was hollow and, and not to disrespect Shirley Theron who did what she could but it's just there was the substance wasn't really there I didn't you have to make me care about a character in order to watch that movie one of the best examples recently that worked that way was T'Challa in Civil War that guy they made him very interesting they gave him a very compassionate um, motivation which is that someone killed his father in front of him and he was helpless to stop it and so he wanted to find the person that is responsible and bring them to justice and when he has the moment where he could possibly kill him he decides nope i'm not going to kill you you're going to actually be punished for your crime by the society and then whatever fate they determine that will be your fate whether it will be execution whether it be imprisonment that is that's his moral code coming through and people were like man i want to see a movie about that guy and then we got black Panther. similar to spider-man Panther. now it wasn't the best mm-hmm. movie but we we got it and people showed up to it because they were really fascinated and interested in that character. Yeah. Um, I saw people from Africa that I think they were like foreign exchange students or also going to the university. They, they saw it and I was still in Mississippi. They, they went to, they went to see it. people from Africa went to, I don't know if they probably came to America specifically to see it, but, uh, it got a lot of audiences. From, I got a lot of African audiences. Um, that, yeah. That that level of uh, intrigue, I don't think, was presented in, in Fury Furiosa with Fury Road, and then because we have a what ten year gap, yeah, um, we it's like oh that character really okay well maybe no I don't know George Miller cool is all the fun you know it, the repetition of the Road Warrior just amped up like a thousand times it is essentially what Fury Road is and I guess to a degree Furiosa there's always the car chases mm-hmm. it's always about the cars the chase the the crazy set pieces, which I think are, are fun for what they are, but it, yeah, it what well, makes those things interesting is what's at stake, and we're losing stakes a lot in film as well. Yeah, and, and I think the, you know you mentioned stakes. Uh, you know, Furiosa, she's a girl who's kidnapped, kind of uh, 
you know, sent off into the world being kind of a concubine. Um, she escapes, becomes this badass woman, takes down, uh, uh, exacts revenge on the death of her mother. Um, you know, as good as that story may be, you know, it, I don't, I don't necessarily think that that story is the thing that that is going to appeal to the audience that the original Mad Max brought in, or the audience you wanted to bring in to make this a blockbuster, which is mostly men. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, you know, and this is, this is where we get canceled and because we're talking, we're talking about stories that appeal to men and stories that appeal to women. This movie felt like it was meant to appeal to both men and women. And therefore you lose, I think because you take that approach, you, you do lose that male audience. And I think we're seeing that here, that, that A, you're losing the male audience and B, you're not really gaining the female audience in the end. Well, there's no, where's the intrigue, right? So when you try to appeal to both, both the male and female demographic, you're playing into those, those angles. What's really fascinating is that when you play into one of those de demographics, when you're bringing the other one in, they get to see a part of the world that they don't normally see. So mm -hmm. for instance, the, 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 um, the drama, the, the passionate drama or the romantic comedy, women like that guys don't always see those types of movies, but they will go with their girlfriends or wives to go watch them and they get a taste of what that is and it, it gives them insight into that world S same thing with science fiction action crime or thriller uh that that's not big on i mean except for the true crime stuff women really love that but you you take a woman you know to to see that with you know girlfriend wife what have you to see that it brings them into their world the only thing that really does appear to appeal to both demographics is mystery mm -hmm. because it's you got Agatha Christie books. You've got uh, you know Arthur Conan Doyle books. For some strange reason, mystery hits both demographics. But when it's controlled on a budget side of things, it always performs really well because you're focused on what's the the mystery, the question, the intrigue. Uh, the, you're playing into curiosity, which is something that has been kind of sort of weeded out of us generation by generation. I'm finding even the um, my godchildren, uh, some of them fr their friends are not curious about anything at all. Like you pose my question, like I don't care. It's like, yeah. I mean, it's like any questions like, Hey, what's the weather like tomorrow? I don't care. <laughs> you know, just, they don't want, I mean, and that's the other part too. Has, mm. has, um, us as an audience and us as a society failed ourselves by not trying to create or stimulate curiosity in, in the yeah. subsequent generations. And if there's no curiosity, then why do we want to go see a movie about Furiosa, a Mad Max story? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the thing I tell my kid all the time. It's you know, aren't aren't you curious about this? Don't you want to know how this is made? Don't you, you know? And uh, it's like, no, just want to watch my videos. Okay. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just finish up. Really fair point, actually, especially the the streaming aspect of it. If you're going to make things available, just literally within a matter of weeks, it's not even months now. It's weeks after the theatrical run. Yeah, what's the incentive? Unless it's some like crazy zeitgeist movie that everyone has to see, which it very rarely is. Yeah, everybody's probably going to wait. Yeah, Barbie, Barbenheimer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people are probably just going to wait, and that's that's an interesting problem that I don't know how you get around. I mean, I know well, people have... Sorry. Sorry, the ticket prices are probably the main reason why, because you don't want to waste money on like a film that might be mid... Because... Um, Fury Road only got like three hundred odd million. Yeah, it wasn't and a big it was hit. And it was nine years ago, so it's a prequel spin-off with female led, which most people, you know, usually associate that with something terrible of a film that came out nearly a decade ago. And the ticket prices are like three times what they were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, and it's not just you; you got to take out your whole family. Then you've got to do something else. It's like over a hundred quid. Yeah, there's. Nice there's there's so many layers to it. You go to the movies, like you just said, you spend a ton of money. Typically now, more than ever, you're dealing with some idiots on their phone in front of you that are distracting you because people are always on their phones. They're always checked out. Um, and then there's just so much to it. Inflation's crazy right now with the economy. Uh, people just don't have as much, much money to spend. And I think the biggest factor is the loss in faith in Hollywood, generally speaking. Yes, there are some surefire things that people will go see because of uh, momentum. Barbie and Oppenheimer are the classic examples of that. But used to, people would look at it and go, I'm a little 50-50 on this movie. I'm not sure. It looks pretty good. People used to tend to go see a movie they were on the fence on, usually. Now they're typically like, if I'm on the fence, I'm probably not going to go see the movie. 
because they've lost so much faith in the general public's trust. So that I think that there's multiple layers that play into this, but ultimately it's the quality of the product that we've been getting consistently for the past five to eight years. Yeah, I mean, I like I know the thing that a lot of people have seized upon is that like this is a, a very obviously female led movie that has not done well, and there, you know, the, the the narrative that some people have tried to build is like, ah, this is the end of the girl boss. Like, it's just a sign that everyone's sick of it and nobody wanted this female led movie. I don't know if that's strictly true, but it does make me wonder if there's um, there is an element of they've had a lot of bad female-led films um, over the past half decade or so, if not more in some cases. And I wonder if they are just more reticent about films like this now just because they've had some bad experiences. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, um, the, it's the girl boss thing. Like, look, we, we consider and say that, you know, girl boss, and that's a, that's a really meme kind of way to look at it. But when they are marketing something that you have to go see this movie because there's a woman in it and she's strong and powerful and you have to support women, that's going to turn off people. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't give people a, a movie with a woman lead in it. You just don't build around that. And plus, this is a this is a male franchise. This is Mad Max. Yes, I know Fury Road. Everybody loved it. I hated that movie, um, but yeah. um, it everybody seemed to love that movie. But it didn't. I think uh, Reaper brought it up. Uh, it didn't. It was like nearly. They had like three hundred and seventy five million or something like that uh, when it's all said and done at the box office, which is not a huge hit even for ten years ago. But yeah. I mean, kind of agree with that. It doesn't it yeah. didn't do anywhere near as well as people. Yeah. I think, the I perception did. was that it did gangbusters at the box office, and it just didn't. It I just think it didn't. had a good word of mouth. Yeah, I think its reputation kind of grew, yeah. maybe with whole media as well. Like people became quite fond of it, and it just became this like um, this bit of a throwback to like the days of practical effects in action movies, where everyone just keeps raving about like, ah, oh, the action sequences are fantastic, and they did a lot of their own stunts and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I think there's probably more CGI than people give it credit for, but, you know, it still looked really good, and it was a pretty yeah. good, fun movie. I, I um, recently... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no I was just finishing up there, so... Anyway. Okay, because I, I recently just watched all the Mad Max movies, because I was, like, a Mad Max noob. I only watched Fury Road years ago, I was like, oh, yeah, it was kind of fun. Uh, and, like, uh, coming up to Fury Road, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to watch all of them. The first one is a wild movie. I didn't know what I was in for. It was crazy. Super, super low budget. <laughs> <laughs> then road then road warrior love that one road warrior is great yeah uh thunderdome i thunderdome. still don't know what what i want to think about that one that is a, another weird one <laughs> the tina turner casting was a yeah. bit of an odd choice yeah but every time it's like all the practical stuff it just all looks really cool and then Fury was like this weird retelling reboot reimagination but kind of isn't and i was just confused when i came back to that one but it was still fun, and so, kind of same with Fury, 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 Furiosa. It's like there's some fun stuff in there, but overall, it's like yeah, I mean, it's a fun movie. Because just coming back to that, I think if it would be another climate for cinema, I think this would have done fine. Like if people would still go to the cinema like they used to, and they're just like, oh yeah, it's like a little popcorn movie, have a little action. It's gonna be fun stuff. But yeah, I mean, well, I think there was like ten just people in my cinema. Everything before we go uh, on, I just I'm sorry, I just wanted to welcome Jedi Brooks to the panel as <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, I'd, uh, <laughs> yeah, you kind of I, I stealthily brought you in there. Um, yeah, no, yeah, like, I, I, so you, you should just ignore them all stream. Let's see how long this could go. I'm totally fine. I'm the late so I replied. You said it to me when I was at work, and I'm literally holding a laser in my hand. So I replied. <laughs> And wrote, this is yes, more important. Yes, and, and, and um, yeah, I just I noticed just before the stream started that you didn't get my reply, so I'm here like ready to go, like oh shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we were able to bring you in anyway. And I, I didn't even realize there was that many of them. Like, um, I had never seen any Mad Max movie before, so I didn't know what the fuck was going on. So we'll get into that. It's it's great that it's as metal like hinted at there. It all started with this low budget Australian post apocalyptic thriller, like with Mel Gibson, who was a fucking unknown back then. Mm. Um, and it's it's a cool little movie. You know, it's not a hugely complicated plot, but none of them are really. Um, but I think Mad Max Two is the one that really put the series on the map. That's the one everyone points to as like the awesome one that everyone remembers. The first one, it's kind of like eh, it's pretty obscure. The third one is just when it got too commercialized and, and uh, you know, disappeared up its own arse, I guess, uh, and too Hollywoodized. And then there was just this huge gap where it just seemed like the franchise was dead and gone. Like, who who was going to make another Mad Max movie at that point? And then, yeah, it's like 
30 years later, we get this crazy um, sort of quasi reboot from the same director with a completely different actor playing Max. And that's how we ended up with Fury Road. And yeah, like you guys said, it wasn't a huge success financially, but people just keep pointing to it as like, wow, that movie was amazing. You know, it, it reinvigorated the franchise. And I think if you were going to do a Furiosa spin off, you probably should have released it within a couple of years. I think if you'd released it around 2017, yeah. 2018, when mm -hmm. it was still like somewhat fresh in people's minds, mm -hmm. you probably would have done a lot better. Yeah, yeah. I also feel like when we, uh, normally when we get these like, I don't know, like adjacent movies about other characters, they're normally like gap fillers until the next one comes out. And I think they're now working on a new Mad Max movie with Tom Hardy in it again. I think I heard. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's true, but that's something I heard somewhere. Uh, well, so yeah, it's just weird because you, you would expect this to be like a gap filler to the next movie and then it's like see, oh that was kind of neat i know what they did like they they actually wrote the entire script for furiosa and gave it to charlie's theron so that she would know exactly what her character's backstory was and what she'd been through mm. to oh, help did. inform her performance which is a cool idea I, I love that like kind of attention to detail and stuff but it was i think the big problem was that george miller was embroiled in a lawsuit with warner brothers for years and years it just dragged on forever because the movie underperformed and he felt that he was not paid what he should have been given uh and it just became this big protracted battle that delayed everything it's just a constant a problem we're in any business that's ever existed that's been successful ask one simple question what's going to make us the most money mm -hmm. You know what's going to make you the most money? Put Mel Gibson in a fucking Mad Max movie at this point in time, and everybody's going to freak out over it. Are there going to be people that are crying about it and whining? Yes, you're still going to make a ton of money, and that's going to be the most successful project that you can get uh, green light with this uh, name and that story. Put Mad Max in it, and that's going to make you the most money, and they're not doing that. And, and again, yes, uh, we like the fall guy. I really liked the fall guy. I had so much fun with that movie, but it's part of the overall problem in Hollywood is that people have lost trust to even go see something that might look good, but they're like, well, I'm not sure. And I don't want to spend this money. Or I don't want to take as much time and I'll just wait till it comes out on streaming or whatever. The fall guy was dumb fun. I had so much fun with the movie, but nobody went to see it because again, yeah. overall faith has been lost. I was having that but same like, conversation um, with a friend yesterday about how, like, people, they really have to um, put in the work to earn people's you know, attention to go to the theater. People aren't just going to go on the regular anymore. That whole, you know, that routine of just like, hey, let's go see a movie. Nobody does that anymore. Like, they yeah. have to actually earn it now. And it's really difficult to do that because they don't see it. Their idea, they've turned it into content. And, like, that's just ruined the artistic aspect of it. You and I know NVIDIA. It's the face of artificial intelligence. The most exciting. Mary's trouble is wounded is in the rough. Mary to us not jump on her. Talking about something a little different today, I'm talking about a movie, uh, Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. I'm talking about it because uh, I love Mad Max, and you may remember uh, I did a video, it still kind of pops up in people's feeds sometimes, I did a video about the 2015 Mad Max video game a couple of years back, and when I saw Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, I'm going to commit to calling it that the whole time, uh, I couldn't help but think of the game, and I actually think that the game kind of changed my perception of this film. I know that sounds kind of weird, but on this channel, I kind of ramble and just talk things out, talk about things I like. Uh, so with that, I do want to talk about Furiosa. I'm not going to talk about spoilers. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it pretty vague. Most of the things I want to touch on don't have to do with spoilers. So if you haven't seen it yet, uh, and, and chances are like the box office numbers, apparently you haven't, uh, maybe see it and come back and watch this video. I don't know. But so going into it, I wasn't the most excited about Furiosa. The trailers, you know, I, I couldn't tell there was something I couldn't quite put my finger on with it and I loved Fury Road so damn much but I, I never really needed a prequel for Fur Furiosa I kind of like the mystique around her but being a fan of Mad Max the old ones uh, but also like really a diehard Fury Road fan I have that's actually a Fury Road poster I got uh, from when I saw it in the theater for like the third or fourth time, uh, fun fact. But yeah, I, I kind of went into it and I was still there day one. I was excited enough, especially just because I was like, all right, doing my duty for George Miller and just like weird, fucked up, crazy movies that we don't see as often now. And I came out of it 
kind of not surprised, essentially. I, I liked it. It was a good time at the movies, but I found it to be nowhere near on the level of Fury Road. I think in terms of just uh, pacing, which is, you know, this is a different type of movie, so it's it's hard, man. I'm going to compare this to Fury Road. I can't help it. It is a different movie. It's sent out to tell a different type of thing, a, a different type of tale, but I just happen to prefer Fury Road, the way it was paced, the way it was constructed, the way it looks, the way it sounds. Uh, Furiosa, to me, felt like it fell short in a lot of those departments, but where it made up for things is in the lore, the exposition, just the essentially the making good of a lot of the interesting little trinkets uh kind of like spread out throughout fury road just all the weird stuff the universe building here they go all in on it and you know you get to see more of what's going on with gas town the bullet farm immortan joe and like his leadership and his sons and all that stuff you get to see a bit more of that and how this world interacts and what i like about it is that it it did do world building and lore right and like you know universe building but it's still it's felt relatively small it's just like a couple of little shitty places uh with factions squabbling uh, between one another and then random people getting caught in the crossfire uh case in point here young furiosa that stuff was awesome and it did feel kind of just like slipping right back into fury road with the, just the world and everything it was just like oh it's good to be back i didn't think the music kicked as much ass though man i think the music and some of the hyper editing of fury road really is what sold it for me like nothing in furioso really topped like the the war rig versus dirt bike scene in in fury road like the and the editing and the the reloads and the you know all that that shit was so sick there was nothing quite on that level here but it had chris hemsworth as a really good villain it also outlined a, a faction of uh, biker people like a biker gang thing which is something we didn't get too much of in fury road but is, is something uh, throughout mad max to, so to see more guys on motorcycles and also chris hemsworth really just ham it up i, I don't know if he's like the most compelling villain in the world but i'd say that he is very appealing in a weird way and you can't help but just like every time he talks or every time he's on screen you can't help but just kind of look and be like what's what's this guy's deal man and that's kind of like a mad max thing from the original film uh is you look at characters in these worlds and go what what is their deal dude what what's going on there and in terms of like the people in the movie like great stuff all around i think anya taylor joy is cool and very like mysterious looking in her own way uh and i think that she did a good job kind of replacing charlize theron i think that's not easy to follow but i think it worked here for the most part uh her shaved head looked kind of i think most people from a from a just a film going experience never mind on the box office and political jargon this is a movie alone they enjoy it of weird i think she wore a bald cap for it or they did some digital stuff i don't think she actually shaved her head and i, I thought it looked a little weird but she has a striking presence throughout like the face you know the, the scariness of furiosa with the oil smeared head i thought it all just really worked and i like that she didn't say a lot in the movie man like that's it's kind of like a mad max thing like they're just going along this adventure uh so i'm glad that it was it was similar but also uh tom burke as praetorian jack this dude is, I love this dude. I thought he was a good, uh, like, addition to the story and with Furiosa, and I won't spoil that, but uh, he was just cool as hell. And I like that he's kind of like, and you've seen him in the trailer, like, he kind of is like the Mad Max archetype, but like in a different situation. I was just watching, I was like, this guy is sick. This guy reminds me of Snake. He this is cool. And uh, apparently, <laughs> according to Hideo Kojima, he said the same thing. Uh, put his tweet on screen here. Yeah, so. Snake from Snake Guy. Uh, snake from, uh, Better go solid. Oh, hey, great minds think alike. <laughs> Again, while I have my criticisms and I think some things Furiosa didn't do as well as Fury Road, I think in terms of the world building stuff, it did good. But I think for me, it just doesn't hit as hard is because I've been exposed to a lot of that world building already. I mean, so there was like the comic prequel thing and there's like a lot of stuff out there and little nuggets of lore that have been 
you know, circling around since Fury Road, which was, you know, like a decade ago now at this point, but also that 2015 video game. I couldn't help but think of the game as I watched this movie uh, for a variety of reasons. There are things that I look at as almost directly referenced. Uh, of course, there's it's more complicated than that. It's not like this movie Furiosa stole from the Mad Max video game because there's a long, complicated history of how the 2015 Avalanche Mad Max game was made. I mean, it was originally a George Miller and Corey Barlog thing. Uh, where, you know, like the guy behind God of War, uh, most notably, of course, God of War 2018, uh, in, in the late 20 whatevers, the 20 zeros, what do we call that now? Like 2008, 2009, I don't know. He had been working with Miller to come up with concepts for a Mad Max game, and it never really came to fruition, but Corey did go on to apparently consult with Avalanche and work on some Mad Max stuff, though apparently very different. But still, there is some DNA. Avalanche was able to use stuff, ideas, concepts, art, and stuff. So there is some synthesis, some cohesion there, whatever. And so like some of that stuff ended up in the video game, a lot more ended up in this new Furiosa movie. So for me, it just kind of felt like I was like, oh, well, I've, I've actually spent more time in this world. I did get to know Gas Town a little bit more. I, I did get to see a lot more of what was going on. I did get to see what was going on with Immortan Joe's sons and stuff like that. But Granted, it is different because the Mad Max 2015 game is not counted as as canon. It's it's separate. You know, obviously there are references in it and people wanted to think of it as kind of like a Fury Road connected thing. But like all Mad Max projects up until Furiosa, uh, this was just its own thing. Another Mad Max adventure in another world with familiar elements because that's how it's always been since the original movie. And during Furiosa like press stuff, uh, George Miller did go on record about the 2015 game. The world made choices for us. Then I will do what must be done. You see the fair. He said, and I quote, We did have a video game made when we made Fury Road. We've been asked many, many times to do one, and it wasn't as good as we wanted it to be. It wasn't in our hand. We gave all that material to a company to do that. I'm one of those people that you'd rather not do something unless you can do it at the highest level, or at least try to make it at the highest level. I've been speaking to Kojima here, who came all the way from Japan, if he would take it on, but he's got so much fantastic stuff in his own head that I would never ask him. But... <laughs> It's a hell of a quote. Obviously, Hideo, you know, buddies with all the movie directors, so this makes sense, of course. But I'll disagree with him on the Mad Max thing because I know he said that it wasn't as good as, as he wanted it to be, but I thought it was pretty damn good. While it does feel very much like an open-world video gamey product, a thing based on Mad Max, right? Like, it's not this high art thing. Uh, it was fun. I, I made a whole video about it, of course. Uh, I, I, it's very much just like open world stuff. But when you frame it around this beautifully designed, you know, lonely wasteland and have great car combat and simple Arkham style hand to hand combat. Uh, for me, it, the game nailed the thing. It's like you're like a, a shitty guy in a shitty car in a shitty world and you're just adventuring and it, it totally nailed that. So I think what I'm also trying to say is that between Mad Max Fury Road and and uh, Furiosa, I kind of had gotten my fill of the rest of that world, you know? Again, it, it's not technically that world, but it, it's just spending time in a similar Mad Max thing uh, that may have had some osmosis with Fury Road and Furiosa. I don't know. Not all of the lore and the expansion and stuff like that surprised me. A couple of things that I won't spoil, especially towards the end, were really cool, but like, yeah, I, I feel like I have been here already, been here, done that. And I actually think some of the aspects of the game that did borrow and expand upon Fury Road, I actually think did a little bit cooler than the movie did. You know, getting to see some of these factions, especially like the places they build, uh, the little enemy types of war boys and stuff like that. Uh, and again, Immortan Joe's sons, I, I think, you know, there, there's some cooler stuff going on in the game. I know that might sound blasphemous. I know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just too like, I rotted my brain on the game. I don't know. But I still think Furios at the very least is a good time at the movies. Uh, the CGI was, you know, a little rougher than in Fury Road 
Road. I know everybody likes to say that Fury Road was all practical effects. It, it technically wasn't, uh, but here I feel like the you know the, the blurring of the line between practical and special effects and visual computer effects uh, was more apparent. You noticed when a guy on a dirt bike wasn't really a guy on a dirt bike, and he was just like a wiggly CGI man. That stuff I found a little distracting, but just a good regular old solid adventure in a Mad Max world. I was happy to be back in the, in this like Fury Road world for sure and I'll always take more. But on the other hand, I like when every Mad Max movie is completely different. This feels like the first one where it's like, okay, we're continuing things a little bit. I thought they've always had the magic of being their own completely different thing, you know? So even though Furiosa is a prequel to Fury Road, at the very least, like like genre and presentation-wise, it is a very different movie from Fury Road, where Fury Road was just one big long chase scene. This was more of a saga, a thing with a character. I think ultimately for the next Mad Max thing, whether George Miller goes and does Wasteland, which would be a pure uh, another prequel to Fury Road about Mad Max, or does a whole nother different thing, I just like the series for, again, just a shitty dude in his car in a bad wasteland, you know? Furiosa was like a decent, like, diverge from that. I, I'm probably, like, contradicting myself and talking myself in circles here, but, like, you know, it was good enough of its own different thing, but now I'm ready for a guy in a leather jacket in a car to kill shit again. Will that ever happen again? I don't know. I hope so. George Miller's getting up there, but I think these things, all these things, whether it is Furiosa, which isn't my favorite, it's still really damn good and better than, like, half of the shit I've watched recently. Are you kidding me? I like, don't, don't get it twisted here. I've watched like multiple movies since I've seen Furiosa when it opened this weekend. And I already forgot about those movies, but I still remember Furiosa. So, you know, he still knows how to make them. And I just, I just hope they're more. I think that even if they're not perfect, sometimes they should be celebrated. And you know what? Just another opportunity. So should the fucking game. The game is cool, man. If you can get past some open world, busy work stuff, there's just a lot of cool driving around doing badass stuff. Long convoluted way of saying, yes, like uh, my ranking of Mad Max movies, Furiosa isn't at the top. It's certainly not at the bottom by any means. I think Thunderdome is. I know that's like a pretty popular th like take, but yeah, I still think you should go and see it. If you love Fury Road, like me, yeah, of course. Either way, I just kind of wanted to get my thoughts out here because watching the movie, I couldn't help but think of the game like the whole time. I was hope I was able to like get that across properly and maybe you feel the same way from what you saw on screen to also just like the feeling of being in this world. Let me know your thoughts on Furiosa. Let me know your thoughts on uh, Mad Max the game. Let me know your thoughts on anything Mad Max. I would love to talk about this with you guys. Thanks for letting me come here and talk about something I like Mad Max stuff. Uh, if you like what I'm doing here and just putting out yapping about shit I love, clicking the like button helps me. Thank you. But that's it. I'm Jake Baldino. Subscribe because video games, pizza's on me.